Yo, let's go. What's up? What's up, y'all? The Durango 95 purred away a real horror show. A warm, vibrate feeling all through your gutty warts. <laughs> What's up, y'all? Tonight we're covering A Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess. We're going to be looking at the novel. Uh, we're going to be deep diving into the novel and, of course, the film. Um, and one of the uh, major points for tonight uh, that I'll be covering is the differences between the film and and the book, because there are huge differences, there are stark differences between the two, um, and shouts out to everybody who's here tonight, on a, on a cool, crisp, it's a cool, crisp, autumn evening, it's a cool, crisp, autumn evening, and tonight, we're going to be covering a Clockwork Orange, um, so let me know if the volume's alright, y'all, it's good to be back, um, it's gonna be back in the, good to be back in the HQ, at the home base, had a nice little uh, little holiday there, a little vacay down south. Got back, and uh, boy, um, yeah, it's good to be back. But I sure did have a good time. Um, did a lot. I got my got my rocking my TCB shirt, and it's good to see everybody here. And shouts out before we begin to uh, DPH, our homeboy David Patrick Harry at Church of the Eternal Logos, who's out there with the fam right now, having a good time. Um, Having a wholesome evening. Shouts out to him uh, because he's a, a good homie. He's our good friend out there. And uh, he really boosted us. He really boosted us past um, 1,000 here. So we're going to be having our uh, 1,000 subs uh, stream party, our Caddyshack party later this week. So I'll keep you posted on that. That's going to be a good time. And it's just going to be nothing but silliness and uh, talking about the <laughs> the film Caddyshack. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> doing that like 13, 14-hour <clears throat> drive down there um, – through the hurricane, I listened to, uh, I listened to, you know that song, You Can Call Me Al? I can call you Betty. You know that song? Well, that's a, I mean, that's a Caddyshack song. I mean, yeah, it's got Chevy Chase um, in the video from like 1987, but, um, 86, 87. But, um, <laughs> but I listened to that song like a million times on the way down there. And that's a Caddyshack song. And then, of course, um, and I'll be talking about uh, Futile and, and Stupid Gesture, the film uh, that's based on the book. But it'll be, it'll be a fun Caddyshack stream. But anyway, so let's get to tonight because this one's going to be, I think, is going to be interesting uh, because we're going to be talking about Anthony Burgess's um, early 60s. What year did he publish this? 19... 63, I think. Uh, let's check. Let's check the biblio here. Um, 1962. Anthony Burgess's 1962 novel, A Clockwork Orange. And uh, most of y'all, I mean, you've probably seen the film. Just about everybody's seen the film. Um, but we're going to be talking about the book and deep diving into the book. And one of the interesting things about this, really, uh, just to begin, is um, is the forward, the author's forward, because he says some pretty interesting things about the work itself, and um, and so let me just give a, a recap about of what the book is about because it really is he addresses the idea or the issue of the fable um, in his foreword. Now, usually when we're analyzing text, we're not going to pay um, so much attention to uh, the author's own um, words about his own text because the text will speak for itself and the narrative, the plot, the structure, the con the form and content and the meaning. But this one's interesting because it gives a little bit of context to uh, the publication because you may not know that. Um, so just before I give a plot, a basic plot run rundown, um, the book published in 1962 was banned um, in the UK. Well, it was published, actually, it was, the book was published in the UK, and later it was the film, it was Kubrick's film that was banned in the UK, um, infamously banned. And so I'll be addressing, the, again, the differences between the two and what, what Kubrick did um, with, the, with the story, because he really made it his own. But um, it's interesting because the book is structured in three parts. It's kind of like a three-act play it's not a it's not a tragedy and there are um theatrical versions of this i actually auditioned for a um for a uh th a stage version of this play in belfast and the guy who uh won the part um went on to be and have you ever seen that movie there's a movie it's probably on netflix now it's called the survivalist um and he's in that movie that he's briefly in that movie that um tgf and jerry or no, it was TGF, Jerry and I and TGF did uh, H.P. Lovecraft. Shouts out to Jerry out there, homeboy, the Iceman Expo. 
exposing powerful lies, live streams, and to TGF, the Green Feathers, Nick. Nick and I covered um, The Troubles, and we covered a movie um, about uh, Belfast in the early 70s, and it's got him in it. He's from the Divis Flats in Belfast. He won the part. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, there are theatrical versions of it. But um, the, it, the book is structured in, um, in three parts, and each part has seven chapters. And what actually happened was that um, he says that when he – come here, baby. Oh, sorry, my dog, dog is walking around. Um, so when he published the book, he had it published um, first um, in New York, and what happened was um, – he uh, he went to the publisher. They gave him a, an advance, and at the time he was desperate, you know, for money. For money, even though Burgess is an establishment guy, but he was he was desperate for money. He says, and so he took the deal. And the deal was that they would publish it in. They would publish twenty chapters instead of twenty one chapters, and they left off the twenty first chapter. However, when it was published everywhere else in the world, they published it with the full twenty one chapters. And Kubrick's version is the twenty chapter. Um, movie version of the of the book if that makes sense i'll get into why that's the case and what i think happened there with the meaning of the work and burgess's own misunderstanding of his own work which is not unusual um that sounds uh that sounds uh, pretty that sounds like a pretty bold statement i guess but it's not unusual authors um and poets often have a um not, i wouldn't say a misunderstanding that's a, that's not the correct word for it but a they don't have um, the reader's uh, appreciation or understanding for the work because they created the work. And so it's, a, it's just a different perspective, I suppose. Um, so, okay, so let's get into what happens. So, so this is a dystopian work. It is set in kind of a nebulous future. It's really set now. Um, it was written in 62, but it's set now. This is like, and all the stuff that um, Jay has been talking about with, um, with, um, uh, Fabian Society. Um, shouts out to Jay over there, Jay Dyer at Jay's Analysis, um, who's done obviously um, extensive work into this and written two books about it, um, Esoteric Hollywood One and Two. Um, and he wrote about Clockwork Orange, so he's kind of the um, Jay is obviously the expert, especially on Kubrick. But um, we're going to be looking at the text, and I think that uh, this is the book is really describing now in a number of ways. Um, because it's a completely sort of alternate future, and um, it's typified by a, a sort of um, a Britain with a um, a youth culture that is, in 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 a number of ways, the the global culture that we live in now. And I see the I see the way that they speak, um, the NADSAC way, the the vernacular that they use, as no different really from. Any kind of youth vernacular and terminology, it's just specific to the book. And, you know, of course, if you've seen the movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about or read the book. Um, Alex, the protagonist, Alex DeLarge, has a, has his own, it was me, Alex, and my three droogs, right? <laughs> and they are engaged, and Alex actually is only 15. He is only 15 years old, um, which is incredible. Um, and that plays, that gives you really a completely different perspective of what happens to him um, in the text and in the film. So what happens is he spends his nights um, with his uh, three droogs, and they are engaged in basically uh, crime, drugs, and um, ultraviolence. And they you know, have sort of gang warfare surrounded by the brutalist architecture of really um, proto- proto-globalist, um, dominated uh, uh, Britain, airstrip one, essentially. And he um, commits a crime. He, he basically, he gets in a, he has a, a, an altercation with his friends, his droogs, and he uh, asserts his leadership uh, based on a certain, certain situation um, while they are, while they are um, doing some pretty bad things to some people. And um, he asserts his leadership his uh, total domination over the droogs, but they uh, they backstab him, and when he's coming out of a house after he's just committed a horrid crime, um, they they basically set him up, and then um, when the uh, coppers when the coppers arrive, he gets nicked, 
and he gets taken to um, a nameless hole of a jail of a jail, um, and you know it's kind of like B- B- Belmarsh, but ubiquitous Belmarsh, and um, he gets thrown in with the with the criminals, <coughs> and uh, what happens is <laughs> shouts out to Jason out there, very first super chat. Right? In it. In it. That's our first super chat. If you didn't notice, we got a super chat function. Shouts out to Jason out there who says, um, woohoo, BLA, here's a super chat. Shouts out to Jason. Thank you so much. Appreciate you, homeboy. And I got I to gotta give a special shout out also to our homeboy Jack out there who sent me a few bucks um, a couple days ago. So I really appreciate y'all. Thank you so much. Yeah, you can click that button and hit me, uh, send me some super chats. You can still super chat me up. Um, Venmo, PayPal, Cash App. That gets directly to me, by the way. So that helps a lot. But if you want to super chat any way you want to support me, I really appreciate it. And also, please make sure you smash the like. Leave a comment afterwards. Um, I got to thank y'all so much for being there for the um, for the Hocus Pocus and the Hocus Pocus 2 stream that I did when I was down there in Mississippi um, with our homeboy DPH over at his channel, Church of the Eternal Logos. I thought that was really fun. We did kind of an epic analysis of those two films. And also... Again, shouts out to uh, Jay and Jamie because they'll be doing Hocus, their own uh, Hocus Pocus 2 analysis. They're based um, Hocus Pocus 2 analysis uh, for Spooktober, trademark JD, on the 13th. Y'all, it's going to be uh, spooky. <laughs> so, um, as I was saying, what was I saying? Thank you so much, Jason. Um, what I was saying was um, that he, essentially, he finds out that there is a program for a new treatment. And this will allow him to, you know, get out of jail free. Uh, he thinks right and he submits himself to a i don't want to say a government program but it is it is government co-opted or at least run on the surface that's in the text right and this ends up being um a total uh monarch mind control uh, uh manipulation behavioral modification program that um that essentially changes him and makes him lose his will and makes him uh in a in a real Pavlov's human experimentation uh, aspect, it makes him um, regurgitate um, at the repugnant sight of violence that drove him so strongly before, and this ends up uh, kind of rolling back on him because when he gets free, he's back into society, and a bunch of things happen to him where um, the first kind of half or rather act and a half of the book sort of mirror and invert and it all rolls back onto him and then he he ends up at the house of the yeah he ends up at the house of the um of the of the uh the of a writer that he broke into and he assaulted um him and his wife and they uh turn the tables on him and then he defenestrates himself tries to keel himself jumps out the window and then next thing he knows he wakes up in a hospital bed he's been cured he uh, i was cured all right he was cured of the ludovico treatment which is what it's called and they tell him that um you're free we're gonna get you a good job we've got you a lifelong pension um and now you can go back to your old ways essentially <clears throat> and that kind of sounds crazy but it works in the narrative because um, because, well, because of the moral problems, um, the sort of complex moral problems, or at least nuanced moral problems, um, that are, inher- that are sort of come to light within the structure of the book. And the 21st chapter that the, the book, the movie ends with him saying, you know, I was cured. All right. But that's not the way that the book ends. And the book is completely different. Um, yeah, uh, Papa says, when I first saw the movie, I remember being thankful I could blink my eyelids. Absolutely. I mean, the the way that they portray Kubrick and, and of course, Burgess, who wrote it, um, portray the, um, the behavioral modification is, I mean, this book contains many of the revelatory elements that we see in this sort of con- conspiracy uh, world, um, in literature, in the white papers, in and in reality now, but our, our, you know, our, you know, reg, regular people, everyday uh, concept of what this involves is informed a lot by Clockwork Orange. And <clears throat> I think, excuse me, I think that, excuse me, folks, listen, before I get any more, I'm going to make sure I want to say cheers to y'all out there. 
I'm going to crack a good GMO drink. You know, we're out here talking about Alex DeLarge. That's what I used to call myself when I was a young man in Austin. I went to a rave last night. Somebody handed me some uh, vitamins, as they call them in England, vitamins. It was crazy. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, so, <laughs> so um, yeah, it, 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 there are a lot of rev revelatory elements in the book and the film, and I think that people often forget this. And there's one element especially that people, that goes, I don't want to say unnoticed because everybody here probably notices this, but one of the key things um, in, especially in a, a PSYOP movement that happened a couple years ago that came to, you know, that was big in the political world, if you know what I'm talking about, goes by a single letter of the alphabet, <laughs> um, but that was based on real things that c continue to happen. Um, uh, Arduino is mentioned in the text and in the film. And it's pretty subtle. I mean, again, obviously everybody here probably knows this, but it, it's pretty subtle. But um, it is revelatory and inf and informs the uh, informs the text. So let's go ahead and dive into it. Clockwork Orange. Also, um, it, one of the brilliant things that Kubrick did is, you know, he he rewrites he re he rewrites a lot of the script. Um, and that's his right to do, and I'm going to discuss that in a minute. But he really punches it up in a number of ways, and that's pretty rare um, for the film version of a book. All right, so here we go. So the forward says that um, he first published the novella, Clockwork Orange. You can read this in a, in a couple hours, by the way. It's a, it's a short and easy read. Um, I first published the novella A Clockwork Orange in 1962, which ought to be far enough in the past for it to be erased from the world's literary memory. It refuses to be erased, however, and for this, the film version of the book made by Stanley Kubrick may be held chiefly responsible. I should myself be glad to disown it for various reasons, but this is not permitted. I love how he says that in the third person. I receive mail from students who try to write themselves about it. Uh, the right theses about it or requests from Japanese dramaturges who uh, turn it into a sort of no play, the Japanese no. It seems likely to survive while other works of mine that I value uh, more bite the dust. This is not an unusual experience for an artist. Rachmaninoff used to groan because he was known mainly for a prelude in C-sharp minor that he wrote as a boy while the works of his maturity never got into the programs. Kids cut their pianistic teeth on a minuet in G, which Beethoven composed only so that he could detest it. Interesting, he brings up Beethoven there because that's one of the main uh, through lines that Kubrick, again, punched up for the film and is not in the book. I have to go on living with a clockwork orange, he says, and this means I have a sort of authorial, uh, author authorial um uh, duty to, uh, I can't read it because I wrote over the text here. I have a very special duty to it in the United States and I'd better now explain what this duty is. Here's what he says. A Clockwork Orange has never been published entire in America. The book I wrote is divided into three sections of, of seven chapters each. Take out your pocket calculator, okay, and you will find that these add up to a total of 21 chapters. 21 is the symbol of human maturity, or used to be, since at 21, you got the vote and assumed adult responsibility. Whatever its symbology, uh, remember in Boondock Saints, what's like the symbology of that? Symbolism, Willem Dafoe says. The word you're looking for is symbolism. Uh, he says, whatever its symbology, the number 21 was the number I started out with. Novelists of my stamp are interested in what is called arithmology, meaning that n the number has to mean something in human terms when they handle it. The number of chapters is never entirely arbitrary. Just as a musical composer starts off with a vague image of bulk and duration, like a sculptor, so a novelist begins with an image of length, and this image is expressed in the number of sections and the number of chapters into which the work will be disposed. <laughs> Those 21 chapters were important to me, but they were not important to my New York publisher. The book he brought out had only 20 chapters. He insisted on cutting out the 21st. I could, of course, have demurred at this and taken my book elsewhere, but it was considered that he was being charitable and accepting the work at all and that all other New York or Boston publishers would kick out the manuscript on its dog, on its dog ear. 
I needed money back in 1961, even the pittance I was being offered as an advance. And if the condition of the book's acceptance was also its truncation, well, so be it. So there's a profound difference between A Clockwork Orange, as Great Britain knows it, and the somewhat slimmer volume that bears the same name in the United States of America. Let's go further. He says, The rest of the world was sold the book out of Great Britain, and so most versions, certainly, of course, he country name drops here. The French, Italian, Spanish, Catalan, Russian, Hebrew, Romanian, and German translations have the original 21 chapters. Now, when Stanley Kubrick made his film, though he made it in England, he followed the American version, and so it seemed to his audiences outside America ended the story somewhat prematurely. Audiences did not exactly clamor for their money back, but they wondered why Kubrick left out the denouement. People wrote to me about this. Kubrick and my New York publisher coolly bask in the rewards of their misdemeanor. Life, life is, of course, terrible. Okay, so let me, let me stop there and just say, here's the thing. Here's the thing, bro. When you write a book, and it's, you know, it's a great book because we're analyzing it now, but when you write a book, okay, and you sell the rights of your book to a filmmaker, then you no longer have the rights. So now he's going to make it his own, for better or worse. Duh. So I love that, you know, this this continually um, happens, especially with Kubrick. Remember that this was also, you know, this infamously happened with The Shining, right? With um, with uh, Stefan Stefan Kang, Stefan Creeper Kang, right? He sold the rights to The Shining of The Shining to Kubrick, who made a film, and he made it his own. It's his own work. It's his own piece of art. Now, it's obviously, he didn't write the story. He didn't write the original, <coughs> but he re- he rewrote the screenplay, which is his right to do because he bought the rights. Makes sense, right? Now, the reason that this is different with Kubrick than with other filmmakers and other books is that obviously, uh, you know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, be all over Kubrick here, um, but, you know, his work, the, we all know that the Kubrick works speak for themselves and are highly revelatory of the things that we talk about here, right? And um, endlessly watchable, endlessly analyzable, I guess. And um, The Shining becomes its own work. That's why Dr. Sleep, you know, the sequel, has its own um, terrifying and repugnant and disgusting things in it. Um, but it is completely different. It's a sequel to Steve, Stefan Creeper Kang's work. And in a way, um, the truth of it, the truth that comes out of a work of art um, is it, it becomes a different work with a, with a different a different look at truth, if that makes sense. Because the whole thing about the, you know, the for instance in The Shining with the haunted, the haunted hotel, well, what obviously, and this is in, again, in Jay's work, I mean, and in Rob Ager's work, that the, the thing that comes out of The Shining film is that the hotel is haunted by the demonic spirit um, of the deeds that are done there. It's not haunted by like, you know, ghosts and goblins like in a Halloween movie. It's much more sinister. It's it's actually sinister and hellish. And A Clockwork Orange does the same thing. I, I would say probably to a lesser extent. It's just a different, it's a sort of a different variation. But what he says next is, is I thought was f- like, not laughable, um, you know, because I'm I'm giving respect to the author here, but it is it's funny. Okay, um, so here's what he says. He says, "What happened in the What happens in the 21st chapter? You know, uh, you now have the chance to find out. Briefly, my young thuggish protagonist grows up. He grows bored with violence and recognizes that human energy is better expended on creation than destruction." Senseless violence is a prerogative of youth, which has much energy, but little talent for the constructive. Its dynamism has to find an outlet in smashing telephone kiosks, derailing trains, stealing cars, and smashing them. And of course, in the much more uh, satisfactory activity of destroying human beings. 
There comes a time, however, when violence is seen as juvenile and boring. It is the repartee of the stupid and ignorant. My young hoodlum comes to the revelation of the need to get something done in life, to marry, to beget children, to keep the orange of the world turning in the rookers of bog or hands of God. And this is one of the, this is one thing that I hate about the book is the, um, is the blatant, um, all right, well, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, and perhaps even create something. Music says, after all, Mozart and Mendelssohn were composing deathless music in their teens or nadsats, and all my hero was doing was raz rezzing and giving the old in out. It is with a kind of shame that this growing youth looks back on his dev devastating past. He wants a different kind of future. There is no hint of this change of intention in the, 20th cha in the 20th chapter. The boy is conditioned, then deconditioned, and he foresees with glee a resumption of the operation of a free and violent will. I was cured, all right, he says. And so the American book ends. So the film ends, too. The 21st chapter gives the novel the quality of genuine fiction, an art founded on the principle that human beings change. There is, in fact, not much point in writing a novel unless you can show the possibility of moral transformation or an increase in wisdom operating in your chief character or characters. So <laughs> what he's going to say here, what he goes on to say, I'm not going to read the rest of it. What he goes on to say here essentially is that um, the 21st chapter of the book is, sorry, is a, is a denouement in the sense that Alex, Alex DeLarge uh, comes of age and sees that his life, his former life was the life of a discontented uh, youth, a droog, and slowly he has to grow up and, um, you know, go for the adult things in life. Now, of course, um, you know, when I was a child, I acted like a child, I thought like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things, right? But that's not exactly, see, it's kind of, it's pretty clever, the conflict here, okay? Because what he says essentially is that um, his view of life is that, you know, human beings in terms of their behavior, they change. And that's interesting because that is a, is a mirror or kind of a flip of what happens within the narrative because Alex does change. I mean, that's like what the whole thing is about. He changes, but not by his own volition, right? He's made to change. And that's what the, the Charlie in the book, uh, the chaplain, the prison chaplain, has a, who's, who is, you know, the only... Um, the only character of any moral standing in the book, right? Because he has a problem with the fact that he 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 doesn't know exactly what's going to happen to Alex in terms of his conditioning and the Ludovico treatment. But he has a feeling that what they're going to do is they're going to um, remove his will, right? They're, it's, it's Pavlov like in extremists. They're going to take away any agency to make decisions. So... In a sense, you know, he doesn't become like, he, he's not, he's, he's not cured in the sense of how a human being is cured. He doesn't see the, the, like, he doesn't see the error of his ways. <clears throat> he does um, see the error of his ways in a few points, and he's, he blatantly states that, but it's only under duress because he's trying to get out of the conditioning, and he knows that's what they want to hear. I mean, he's a... He is psychopathic, right? So I think that's one thing that, in my opinion, of course, that Burgess, even though he wrote the book, is either willfully not understanding about the character because he wrote, I mean, he wrote this total psycho, right? But you got to remember that he's also, he's also a key, he's a keyed, okay? And, you know, when you watch the film, you don't really get that sense. You think, okay, these are just sort of a, like an ageless group of you know young young you know young dudes, and they're hanging out at the uh, Corova Milk Bar and all this stuff. But they're these guys are teenagers, um, and the fact that they do this to them is is obviously disturbing. Now, now the reason they do it is also valid in that in this in, in the sense that um, crime. Uh, violent crime of the worst kind has overridden their society, right? And they want to get rid of it by any means necessary. But what they're not owning up to is the fact that they are also responsible for creating the atmosphere that gives rise to this crime. I mean, look at now, right? 
It's this. It's the. It's like the same thing now. Um, and then what they do is the people who run the treatment and the government and all these people um, within the uh, book. Then what they do is they get rid of the. They deprogram him, but in such a way where he goes right back to what he was doing. I mean, it's it's almost like you know, it's like dystopian British Phoenix program for uh you know monarch uh, teens set in the current day uh in a in a concrete hellscape if that makes sense um so so what he says is that um <coughs> is that <coughs> the americans in his view the americans had a more and he was told this by his publishers he was like the americans this is in 1962 the americans have a more realistic uh vision of human nature right they know that um people don't change and so the book has to end with him going right back to we know that he's going to go right back to the way that he was and his vision is that people do change and that um and that there has to be a, ha a happy ending to the book but what i think happens ironically is that his version is the fable is his version is the fable Right, he thought the American version. He says it in the in the introduction that in the forward that the he, that the American version was a fable of bad behavior, whereas in reality, um, his his version is the fable. Um, but it's not a fable where you gain any sense of you know virtue or morality. It's just a fable of a, a dystopian sort of uh, anti future. Does that make sense? Um, let me try and, and uh, break this down a little bit with the with the uh, some of the text here. So, first of all, uh, what happens um, at the start? And I love that in chapter one, you know, the opening of the. Oh, also, uh, just to mention before I forget, <clears throat> when he was talking about the uh, symbolism of the chapter numbers, uh, that's important in the sense that the best examples I can think of with that that come to mind right away. Um, are, you know, if you have a book with, for instance, you know, 24 chapters, you are mimicking the uh, 24, you know, you're, you're saying as a, as the author that your book is um, an epic, right? You're, you're mimicking the structure of the Odyssey or the Iliad or, or um, the Aeneid, you know, um, when you have uh, a book with, um, three sections and 21 chapters, it's interesting that the last chapter is cut off because it's kind of like, it's kind of like um, the structure of a sonnet. Uh, and, you know, it's, yeah, I always go back to Shakespeare, but that's for a reason, you know, it's, it's foundational in terms of, you know, English uh, literature. And when uh, Shakespeare or any of the Elizabethan writers or even all the way through the, uh, neoclassical writers are like Alexander Pope with with um, heroic couplets, right? Um, when they have the standard structure of the ten syllable line, right? Unstressed, stressed, five poetic feet, iambic pentameter, five poetic feet uh, with an unstressed rhythm, and they there's there there's all of a sudden um, nine syllables. Or there's an extra syllable, so there are eleven syllables, which is called an Alexandrine for Alexander Pope. Um, what that's saying is that you are, and the content has to reflect this. It's saying that you're either lacking something, or there is a there's an overabundance of something, and that will match whatever you're discussing in the content, right? Um, so, in other words, the ten syllable line is supposed to, in really a kind of a it's almost a Nokian, right? It's, it's like this numerological symbol for, um, for like the ordered universe, right? It's always the same in the structure of the verse lines. And when you're missing a, a syllable, it's noticeable. It means that there's a lack, right? Or there's an overabundance. And it's the same with the missing chapter in this. In fact, the last chapter of the book is so bizarre because... It, it again it, it it mirrors or mimics 
the entire structure of the novel in that things kind of have this weird eternal return. It goes back to <coughs> the language of the last chapter. It goes back to the first chapter. It's almost exactly the same. But then there's a slight variation. We see that um, all of a sudden Alex's thoughts are changing. But it's so bizarre. It's almost dreamlike. And that sort of gives me the indication that, that um, he's been so tempered by his own um his own behavior and then of course his conditioning his programming that the world seems almost dreamlike to him like he doesn't really have agency over it. it's almost like it does it's not happening it's almost like there's a split like a psychic split the book begins with um the speaker saying what's it going to be then eh now this is interesting because you know the first the first line of a novel has to be punchy right and the the first line of this of this novel is is pretty famous and again that's mirrored in the final chapter in the 21st chapter but it's interesting that kubrick of course taking ownership um of the of the novel and the story doesn't begin the film that way in fact he he omits that and you you have to just imagine that burgess saw the film and just went what the bloody hell is this right Grotty little wanker. Um, fucking wanker. Right? He cut his first line. And, I, you know, he made it better because we don't need, we don't need the first line um, that he has here in the book. In fact, we are immediately, um, we see Alex right uh, in this shot. We see Alex in this shot right here. And, you know, he's in the Corova milk bar. And um, he's doing that, you know, famous uh, Kubrick stare. And he's got his friends, his friend Dim there on his right, you know, our left. And um, they are at the Corova Milk Bar. They're just chilling. And we, uh, we have this long shot going into the Corova Milk Bar. And he's, he introduces himself. It was me. It's interesting that he says it in the, third, in the third person. It's also in the past tense, right? So we know from the very beginning with this sort of unconscious dramatic irony that we are listening to the um, story, the past tense story of this guy. We don't know what's going to happen to him, but we know that whatever happened, he is alive at the end, right? Um, so it's sort of all's well that ends well. It's really, it's, an abs it's sort of an absurd comedy. And that's what, <coughs> excuse me, that, excuse me, folks. That's what Kubrick really um, latches onto in the book and, and, it, and exploits. I mean, the novel is, the the film is is exploitative in the sense that obviously it exploits violence um, in a way that got it of course got it banned in the UK but um, like the whole singing in the rain bit right it's it's absurd it's absurdity it's almost like Ionesco absurdity uh, it's almost surrealist because it's showing you that the the level that we've reached where these things are so commonplace. Like, okay, there's a scene uh, where, you remember the scene where um, Alex goes home and uh, he says, I lived in, um, I lived in flat block, you know, uh, 21A linear north, right? So he gives GPS coordinates for his house. They, you don't even have like street names anymore. Everything's just like brutalism everywhere. And he goes back home and he notices like all the graffiti, all the like lewd graffiti inside of his flat block. The uh, the lift is broken. You know, Billy Boy and his gang, or some some other gang. You know, the uh, Van Cortland Rangers or the Warriors have come through and they've knocked out the lift. And so he has to walk upstairs. He's like, he's got his cane. He puts it you know behind his head. He walks in and then he goes into his room. He locks it. And of course, he's got these sort of um, you know these proto uh proto dystopian boomer parents and um his his mom is basically his mom is like she goes off to her job at the factory but she might as well go off to be the uh the judge in the uh aj case right she's got blue hair or purple hair and um you know she says you're gonna be late you're gonna be late son and he says bit of a pain in the gulliver right um He's got he's to have a lie-in. So he's, he's true in. He's, he's obviously not going to school. And uh, then she goes back into the kitchen and she says, I wonder what he's out, 
you know, doing it all hours of the night. And his dad says, oh, you know, like he says, helping people and whatnot. <laughs> and like, he's out helping people. He's out, he's out at 3 a.m., right, uh, in his Droog outfit with his bowler hat and his Luminate Confirmed eye, you know, uh, eyeball, right, on his cufflinks and his dagger cane and his, you know, one eyelash uh, out like, and Dim, Dim's been out there whipping people with chains or whatever, fighting Billy Boy. They they ended up, um, you know, sending the guy to the hospital. That's why uh, Mr. Deltoid comes to the house, right? Mr. Deltoid is the creep. And that's another thing. That's another aspect that Kubrick did really well in this film. Of course, this, and uh, I mean, look, just buy Esoter Esoteric Hollywood 1 and 2, because Jay's talked about this. Um, and you know, with so much uh, depth and authority and research and analysis, um, that one of the things Kubrick does slyly in his films, you notice that the the um, I don't know how to put this. Uh, you guys know what I'm talking about, though. Before I even say it, the creeper element um, of the societal elites is a through line in almost all of Kubrick's films, right? Eyes Wide Shut, Barry Lyndon, Clockwork Orange. Uh, I'm not even going to say the name of the one work, his first work, the black and white work, L-O-L-I-T-A, right? It's even in Full Metal Jacket. You remember the scene, the uh, the scene where they meet the um, the working the working girl, right? That's just a consistent through line in all of Kubrick's films, and that happens in Clockwork Orange with Mr. Deltoid, who literally... Um, uh, let's say puts his hands on Alex, right? And um, it's I mean it's 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 one of the scenes in the film. Like there's so many. It's hard to say. It's there's so many disturbing scenes in in the film in the film, and the way Alex handles it, of course, is that he handles anybody who oversteps his boundaries or that gets in his way or that he even you know he feels like it um, by offering uh, violence but he doesn't in that scene because he knows it wouldn't be useful to him because this is the guy this is basically his case officer right so he can't do anything and then that guy you know sort of washes his hands of him when he gets to uh when he gets to the clink right um so he says at the beginning of the book he says there was me that is alex and my three droogs pete Georgie and dim dim being really dim and we sat in the Corova milk bar making up our uh, Razudox what to do with the evening uh, Flip dark chill winter bastard through dry though dry the Corova milk bar was a milk plus mesto And you may oh my brothers have forgotten what these mestos were like things changing so scory these days and everybody very quick to forget newspapers not being read uh, much neither well what they sold there was milk plus something else they had no license for selling liquor but there was no law yet against prodding some of the new veshes which they used to put up into the old malaco so you could peat it with Velocet or Synthamesque or Drencrum or one or two other veshes, which would give you a nice, quiet, horror show 15 minutes admiring Bog and all his holy angels and saints in your left shoe with lights bursting all over your, your mosque. Or you could peat milk with knives in it, as we used to say, and this would sharpen you up and make you ready for a bit of dirty 20 to 1. And that was what we were peating this evening. I'm starting off the story with. Okay, so already in the first paragraph, we get a number of things, right? Um, first of all, <coughs> we see that the form and the content uh, uh, work together. They produce this synthesis of a worldview gone askew, right? Where we have a vernacular that is so strange. It is so bizarre that it's hard to even read the words on the page sometimes. That's one of the things that the, the movie does well. It, it it really has this fluidity. It, it's like this seamless transition into this new world because of the the voice that the actors give it. But it's it's also no different from now, really from any time, but especially now, right? And I think part of this, you know, it's obviously um, what they describe, they, they actually... Um, 
There's actually some exposition later on in the book. They describe that um, their language is a combination of um, Cockney rhyming slang and um, Cockney rhyming slang, gypsy language, obviously a sort of a East German slash uh, sort of Russian pigeon speak um, and uh, with a couple other things thrown in. But it's really like, it's like code. It's like youth code. And it's it, that's one of the, it marks one of the stark differences between the youth in the book and the the older power figures. And it's also one of the things that they try to cure him of and that is indicative of his mindset. Because later on, Alex becomes, he's always eloquent. I mean, he's the book is in his voice, right? It's a first-person perspective. It's a first-person uh, POV. And and he's like, he, he when he starts to become more lucid in terms of waking up into their their version of what they want reality to be, um, he becomes much more eloquent in terms of the sort of normie speak or the the adult speak of society. He sort of loses a lot of his um, cockney rhyming slang with with still a few words thrown in, so we can still see he's he's a youth, right? Penny says, "Excellent pronunciation of aura, the horror, the horror." Go check out our Apocalypse Now stream. You guys, if you haven't seen it. <coughs> so, um, real horror show. All through your gutty warts. So, um, so, did you notice in the first paragraph, okay, so what's the deal with them drinking milk, right? What's the deal with that? Why are, in, why are they in this um, uh, Corova milk bar having a bit of the old, um, you know, Malaco uh, before they go and have the um, in-out, right? Some of the old ultra-violence. Well, um, shouts out to Mixkey out there, Tech Noir Graphics, because uh, we both mentioned one time when we were talking that um, Mick and I both were in New York. Kind of, so we, this was years ago, so we didn't know each other then. But um, I was, I lived in New York. Uh, let's see, two thousand four to two thousand five. I lived in the East Village, Alphabet City, and um, and Mick was, uh, I guess, there at the same time, and. Um, there was uh, a place, I don't know if it's still there, um, but there was a place called Corova Milk Bar. It was a, it was a bar, and it was the, like, it was the set from, a, uh, from um, Clockwork Orange. It's the Corova Milk Bar with all the words, Malaco, Velocet on the walls, and all the, the weird mannequins, you know, in their poses. Pretty wild place, typical New York. But what's the deal with the symbolism of that in the book and the film? Well... For one thing, I think it's interesting that like the the font, first of all, on the wall is like this sort of spacey kind of psychedelic uh, wave-like font. And that's supposed to be indicative of the fact that, remember, the film was produced right at the sort of tail end or, at, you know, right after the um, the end of the, you know, the, the climax of the, the, as Hunter S. Thompson said, the crest of the high and beautiful wave, right, of, you know... Um, culture created hippiedom, right? Uh, but also, it's to symbolize the fact that the characters are in a sort of a surrealistic dream state, and that's because of the substances that they are imbibing. And why milk? Why is it milk? Well, because of the, I would say, the symbolic juxtaposition of the fact that we have, first of all, we have youth and old people in the bar. Right, we we do have the bouncers who are kind of like between two ages, but the people that we see in the bar are the in the Corona Milk Bar are the um, the older uh, sophistos, is what he says. Right, the establishment elites who are kind of slumming it um, in this place. Remember in the film the scene where it's like the guys from the symphony and they have the uh, they have the soprano sitting in between them. She's holding the Beethoven sheet music. Remember that scene. Um, and the same thing happens in the book, but it's like we either have the sophistos or we have the um, we have the youth, and they're and they're young, they're very young, these they're teens. Of course, they've lost their liquor license, but what does that mean? Well, I would say that it is indicative of now, in the sense that if you're a regular person, 
right? If you're a regular, you know, if you're just like, let's say you're 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 your average, what do they used to say, uh, Joe six pack. If you're if you're the average Joe six pack out there, and um, you know you're going to the pub, and you're gonna go have a drink, you know it's it's, you go you have a drink, you know the fellas are there, you get a little bit of uh, social hour in, um, before you uh, before you head home, right? Or you've gone home and then you go to the pub and then you go back home or whatever. Um, but that's not what they're doing, right? Alcohol. In the, in the world of, of their society is seen as, this is my reading of it, is seen as a sort of a violent motivator of the, of the masses or hooliganism, which is interesting and ironic because this is like the epitome of, of hooliganism. But what they do condone is, you know, psychotropic drugs. And th- is that not <laughs> indicative of, of, if not the way we are now, but where we're going, right? Just look at Roe Jogan um, and what he discusses on the, and I'm not like criticizing, um, I, well, I am, I am criticizing, but, but I would say that the, I, okay, I would say that the obvious, dangerous, um, skewed vision of the way to find truth and virtue in the world that, people like that espouse um is is sort of typified in the book by the by what they are by by what they're taking and let's look at what they're taking he says oh also uh and the youth and, and and old age um the milk is is like they're young right but they're drinking the the like life giving juice of something that is by definition older right um, so it's, there's juxtaposition. Um, they're also like rejuvenated and they thrive on this sort of weird version of mother's milk, which is milk laced with these substances. And these are like futuristic dystopian substances, but they're based in reality. So Veliset is, <coughs> the etymology of Veliset is like a combination of, uh, it's like, uh, you know, it, it's almost like a, it's like a speedball. They're drinking a speedball, right? It's, it's like amphetamines mixed with uh, uh, opioids, right? Opiates. It's like, um, it's like, I don't know, meth and a Percocet or something in a drink. We have, at least that's my reading of it and what I've always read. Um, synth mask is obviously synthesized uh, mescaline, right? This is like, okay, give me the, the Huxley number two. Um, Drencrum should be obvious, right? It's spelled D-R-E-N-C-R-O-M, which is obviously Arduino. And the thing that Alex likes to drink is the Drencrum because he says it get, it sharpens you up, puts knives in you, gets ready. It, it has knives in the drink, sharpens you up for a bit of the old ultraviolence, he says. And he actually describes it uh, pretty... <laughs> explicitly later on in the text he talks about the feeling um that it gives him and what it does to the other people because it's almost like you know they're taking um you know tmd (laughs) they're taking tmd and they're they're having you know astral projection out of body experiences in the in the corova milk bar so it's interesting that i think that this is marketed in the world of the text it's marketed to the youth and the sophistos not for like the everyday guy, right? Um, let's see. The <laughs> I didn't want to address it earlier, but I don't know how to address it. But the the blasphemy in the book is one of the one of the things that really creeps me out um, in the text because what what um, what Burgess is saying here, not Burgess himself, but the, by having the speaker. Um, in the work say this is he says bog and all his holy angels and saints so it's almost like what they've done is they have degenerated the name of god into not only ba- not only backwards you know al crowley back masking but in this sort of you know bog is a is like a puddle it's like a a mat a, a morass a, a puddle of filth right and so, so what they what they're saying here is that 
everything in their worldview is inverted, right? There's no, Alex has no, he's got, he's got a sense of what goodness is because he goes on to say that he knows what right and wrong is. This is when he's being um, programmed. He knows what right and wrong is, but he's chosen wrong purposefully. He's, he's a psychopath, right? Um, and we get the sense that there is a, there's a distance, right? right? There's a dissociation between himself and the, the, the other one of his selves, which was his former self, right? But we know that he's looking, it's like he's looking at himself in a mirror darkly, right? He knows what the choices are, but he chooses them um, purposefully. And that's, that's because, you know, I mean, his parents, um, no, one, no one in his world has any, like, values um, of any kind except for the, the prison Charlie, right, who tries to show him true, like, compassion and love. And, and the reason, by the way, that the, the chaplain um, goes through with, like, letting Alex make the choice of whether he wants to go through with the Ludovico treatment, I guess, my, ju- my only, like, justification, I guess, that I come up with is that, you know, it's free will, right? He tells him that it's going to be painful. He tells him he doesn't know what, because he also doesn't know quite what it is. And he has a, a sense of a deep-rooted moral problem with what he thinks that the people are going to do to him. Um, but he's also giving Alex the choice of like, look, if you think that this will cure you, if you think it'll make you better, and you know, then, um, then, then sure, go through with it. But he also says to him, just remember when you look back and you think of me, however you end up, that you pray for me um, and that if I've made a mistake, that you forgive me. I, I, that, that's, like, that's like one of the only true like moments of um, you know, compassion or an actual sort of you know, a, a transcendent moment in the text. Um, I thought that was pretty... I, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't come out in the film because... Kubrick makes the whole situation sort of farcical. I mean, Alex is having. Remember that when he's in prison, he's um, he you know he he's the, the assistant to the chaplain, and he's like he's reading uh, the Bible, um, because he's like the chaplain. It gives him something to do, and it gives him something to read. But Alex's vision of because he's sitting there reading, and he's like he's like daydreaming about about the Bible. But what he says is that. He, he pictures himself, remember, they show him, he pictures himself in the Old Testament like being, you know, Roman centurion or like lying down with these, you know, uh, concubines like feeding him grapes. He just imagines like the absolute power and decadence of, you know, uh, human domination because he's, he's a psychopath. Um, so also the, the way that they describe the Drugs is slightly different. Um uh, they're not dressed in the same, quite the same costume that um, that they were made into in the Kubrick film, but obviously he sort of he he improved on that. He made it much more cinematic and memorable. Um, he says, "Let's see, I'm gonna talk about what they um, do, what they decide to do." Oh, uh, one of the interesting things in the text is that <clears throat> you know, remember in the movie where they wear. Um, they wear masks, right? Well, it's really Alex that, that wears the most memorable mask because he's wearing a kind of phallic uh, Pinocchio mask, right, in the film. You know, it's it's just, it's sick. They break into the um, the house that says home on it. Again, it's like a, it's this farcical like inversion, right? So they go, they, they, they're attracted to this, um, this place that says home in capital glowing letters and they break in and he's going to, you know, violate this, you know, poor person. And, um, and he is, um, it's when he's singing, you know, he's singing, singing in the rain and he's wearing this mask. But the way that the masks are described in the book is pretty interesting because he says, we put our mask, we put our, ma- our maskies on, new jobs they were, Real horror show, real horror show. Wonderfully done, really. They were like the faces of historical personalities. They gave you the name when you bought. And I had Disraeli. Pete had Elvis Presley. <laughs> TCB, y'all. Pete had Elvis Presley. Georgie had Henry VIII. And poor old Dim had a poet vet called P.B. Shelley. That's, that was 
a bit of synchro, you guys, because uh, the book that I read prior to this book was a, a biography of Shelley called Ariel that I'm going to do um, later in the week. And I thought that was interesting. You know, why, why those masks? They're obviously, there's obviously heavy symbolism in those. Um, uh, it's almost like in Point Break when we have, we are the ex-presidents, right? And uh, Bodie is Reagan. I'm not a crook, says Roach, right? Um, so Alex obviously has Disraeli because, you know, he's the, he's the top dog, right? He is the uh, prime, minister, prime minister or advisor to Victoria. Which gives him a sense of, you know, uh, power in a sort of pseudo parliamentarian um, system where everybody thinks that they have a say, but he's the power, right? Um, then Pete has Elvis Presley, so Elvis is supposed to be a sort of a nostalgic throwback to the immediate recognition of fame and celebrity. It's also clever that they would use that mask because think about the the fact that the victims would obviously recognize the mask of Elvis they would say that was Elvis right but what that does is by wearing the mask it also detracts from the real face of the person underneath so they are attracted to the guy wearing the Elvis mask um, in the sense that their eye, not attracted in that sense, but attracted in the sense that their eye would take to them and they would have immediate recognition. But the mask is so, um, works so well that you, you don't even think of the person underneath, right? Also, the fact that they're wearing masks um, and, you know, these are just different aspects of their person. I mean, per persona means mask, right? They're masking themselves, but their lives are already a mask of what they do in the life that they're supposed to lead, right? He's out doing good deeds at night, right? Which is, he completely masks that with his parents. He, he, he lies to them with such ease because they're lying to themselves. Um, we also have Henry VIII. So obviously we have this royal persona and, um, and, and one which necessarily involves, um, which brings to mind, obviously, uh, execution and things with women, which is what they do. And then we have poor old Dim was Percy Shelley. And why do we have a Percy Shelley uh, mask? Because Percy Shelley is the um, Luciferian poet um, of the sort of um, mystical lie of the Enlightenment, um, if I can put it that way, right? But Shelley, well, I'll get into this in my Shelley analysis. But remember, Shelley wrote his uh, his thesis, his university thesis on atheism, or at least he, it wasn't his thesis. He published a book on the necessity of atheism, he called it, um, which was really uh, his sort of <laughs> manifesto on um, espousing the Enlightenment French Revolution values, if you want to call them that, of, of uh, this sort of you know, fraternité, right, which is actually the <laughs> mass bloodshed, right, and complete, um, di you know, dissolution and desolation of society. Um, let's see. Uh, in chapter two, I thought it, it was interesting that the first person that they attack is what they call a, what do they call him? Um, they call him a... Uh, he's a well. He's a bolshe. They call him basically the, their their version of like the middle class. I mean, they're they are they call the he's like they call the 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 bourgeoisie sort of the um, the bolshes are like I guess their version of like in the book of boomers in a sense. Like it's how they describe like older people, um, and they go after this uh, this filthy old um, drunky is what they call him, right? So they attack a basically a drunk old homeless guy who is going blub blub, uh, singing the sins of his fathers. And the guy says, though, uh, which is pretty uh, revelatory, he says, um, it's a stinking world. And he says, oh, and what's so stinking about it? It's a stinking world because it lets the young get onto the old like you done, and there's no law and order no more. 
He was creeching out loud and waving his rookers and making real horror show with the Slavos, only the odd blurp blurp coming from his kishkas, like something was orbiting within or like some very rude, interrupting sort of a mood, making a shoom so that this old vet kept sort of threatening it with his fists, shouting, it's no world for any old, age, old man any longer. And that means that I'm not one bit scared of you, my boyos, because I'm too drunk to feel the pain if you hit me. And if you kill me, I'll be glad to be dead. What sort of a world is it at all? Men on the moon and men spinning around the earth like it might be midges around a lamp and there's not no attention paid to earthly law nor order no more. So your worst you may do, you filthy cowardly hooligans. Then he gave us some lip music like we'd done to those young Millicents and then he started singing again and they, they beat him up. They don't kill him because later on when Alex is uh, released from the Ludovico treatment um, and from Pelmarsh uh, or whatever, he, um, he gets attacked by a gang of, um, of uh, hobo demons, right? Um, he gets attacked by a gang of hobo demons and that's like his first stop on his sort of weird version into Dante's Inferno, which for him is actually like, it would almost be like a trip up the circles instead of down because he's going back to real life from the hell that he's unleashed on people, but it becomes his own personal hell because he can't do anything about it, right? He is totally, um, he's, he, he has no defense against the violence that they unleash on him. Um, on pages um, 18 and 19, we get the description of their world. He says, um, he says, it was round by the municipal power plant that we came across Billy Boy and his five droogs. And this is their, this is their showdown with the other gang who, by the way, in the film are sort of like, they have way worse, they have way worse uh, outfits than the droogs do. I mean, the droogs are like consistent, right? Because they've got like the sort of, um, you know, uh, white clinical psychiatric institute outfits on with like cod pieces and stuff and oh that's the other thing about their language their language is sort of a uh francis drake elizabethan pirate version of you know youth they sort of they sort of add in the old archaic you know ye language um to give them this sense of like i don't know uh camaraderie right and Billy Boy and his and his gang, uh, his own droogs are like, they, there's not really any consistency. They're they're wearing like, uh, they're wearing like camo and old um, uh, na Nazi hats and uh, and iron crosses and stuff. And they are in the midst of already um, doing something horrible to this poor woman. And notice in the film also that it's on a stage, right? So it's theatrical because they break into an old you know, broken down old crusty theater and they're literally on a stage and f at least thankfully in this scene when, when, when they break in, this is one instance where unintentionally the girl gets saved because um, she, she's able to run away because the droogs run in and they get to fighting. Uh, Dim hits the guy with his chain. They beat him up real bad. And then what happens is uh, one of Billy Boy's droogs ends up um, snitching on Alex um, and and the other fellas, and uh, that's why Mr. Deltoid comes and says, "Yeah, they ended up in hospital," um, and uh, they they said your name, right? Not like he's you know as if he wouldn't already be known to the coppers, but uh, still they snitch on him, and <clears throat> it says, "Let's see, I wrote, um, <clears throat> oh yeah, his description of the fight, which is unnecessary as a voiceover in the film." The voiceover in the film is so brilliant. I mean, it really is. It's one, it's another instance. You know, it's just like an apocalypse now where the voiceover like really makes the film. Usually, as we discussed in that analysis, like usually the voice the voiceover now is just a trope. It does nothing to add to the to the momentum of the story or, or to any meaning. But in Apocalypse Now and in and in Clockwork Orange, it really adds it it only adds um to, to this sort of ambiance and it's so brilliant and what Kubrick does you know this is what film can accomplish like we see the great artists show don't they don't tell right um, 
And so we are in the midst of the action. And of course, film accomplishes that by sh literally showing us images. But the way that they describe the violence, that, or that um, the speaker here describes the violence, reminded me of Macbeth in one part. Um, he says, he says, um, let's see. There were four of us to six of them, like I've already indicated, it's page 19. But poor old Dim, for all of his dimness, was worth three of the others in sheer madness and dirty fighting. Dim had a real horror show length of Uzi um, or chain around his waist, twice wound round. And, and, they, and Kubrick is faithful to that. Like Dim carries this chain around his waist. Um, and he unwound this and began to swing it beautiful in the eyes or glazies. Interesting that he uses the word beautiful there. Uh, because this is a terrible, this is a Yatesian terrible beauty. And that's one thing I noticed in the, in the text is that their horror, the horror of their violence is often described in almost mystical terminology. Like it's a, like it's a beautiful event. Pete and Georgie had good sharp nauseas, but I, for my own part, had a fine starry horror show cutthroat Britva, which at the time I could flash and shine artistic. Right, he could shot. It's like, I mean, he's almost Dexter like, right? Shouts out to Jeff out there. Jeff got me into uh, Dexter, right? Shouts out to Jeff, um, because the the blood splash that he produces while he's fighting, he sees as almost like a chaotic Jackson Pollock esque activity, right? Um, he says. So there we were, dratzing away in the dark, the old Luna with the old Luna, capitalized Luna, right? Uh, with men on it just coming up. In other words, they're on the moon, and it's and right. It, of course, this was written in it was published in 1963. So this is post um, Kennedy, um, you know, man on the moon um, speech, right? Not be, you know, we're not gonna go to the moon. Uh, for any purpose, we're, we're going to go there because because we can, he said, right, uh, for the new world order. Um, so, so he's he's already predicting, you know, the this I guess the space race, and that's not the important part. He's predicting the he's saying the fact that who cares, right? You're putting men revolving around in space, and that by the way, that's the meaning of the Clockwork Orange. Right, he says that in the forward. Um, the clock, the term, the title, Clockwork Orange, is meant to be again this sort of surrealistic, absurd juxtaposition that comes from a you know a, a sort of an archaic Cockney slang um, expression, which is the sense that the moon is the globe, right? But it's it's like juicy and vibrant and full of life, but it runs on a in a sort of a, a metaphysical version of clockwork which is like a sort of a deistic version of existence in other words what it's saying is that you know the vi the vision espoused in the title of the novel is that like you know is this sort of almost gnostic enlightenment freemason uh, freemasonic deistic uh, creator god who uh, sets the the clock sets the the top spinning and lets it go and has no interaction, and yet people are sort of born and juicy, right? They have life and they have nuance. Um, and that plays into the meaning of free will um, that, is, that really gets at the meaning of the text, right? And the questions about what is free will and what is free will in, in the sense of um, in the hands of how it can be dominated and controlled by the people, by the people who are capable of doing so in their society, and 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 now, right? I mean, I'm not saying that people can change free will, but I'm saying in the sense of what he undergoes in this monarch programming takes away his free will, right? And he says, uh, with men on it, uh, the Luna with men um, on it just coming up, the stars stabbing away as it might be, knives anxious to join in the dratzing. Interesting that all of the verbiage is about stabbing and knives. With my Britva, I managed to slit right down the front of one of Billy Boy, Boy's Droog's platties, very, very neat and not even touching the plot under the cloth. 
Then in the trancing, this droog of Billy Boy suddenly found himself all opened up like a pea pod, with his belly bare and his poor old yobble showing. And then he got very, very rad razdraz, waving and screaming and losing his guard and letting in old Dim with his chain snaking wish so that old Dim chained him right in the glazies. And this droog of Billy Boys went tottering off and howling his heart out. We were doing very horror show and soon we had Billy Boys number one down underfoot, blinded with old Dim's chain and crawling and howling about like an animal. But with one fair boot on the Gulliver, he was out and out and out. Brilliant! brilliant passage do you understand do you understand do you understand how brilliant this writing is in this passage <laughs> it really is i mean the writing is is it's visceral he's the way that he the way that he I, there's no other way to explain it other than that he shows us Right, he doesn't tell us what happened. He's yes, he's telling us in the sense of he's telling the story. You know, it's, it's, it's a narrative, but he shows us the images. He shows us what happens, and it's. I think that this is one. This is one great thing about about great writing. You get this with people like Faulkner, um, with in the sense that a lot of the great novels of modernity of the modern age, especially. Um, of the leading up to the you know sort of postmodern age, um, a lot of the great writing does away with the strictures of the classical order of things in order to fit the chaos of content. And what I mean is that um, they oftentimes they there's a sort of um, a regression, right? It's it's like an they infantilize the language because it it shows that the characters are it, like they they're they are literally children right they are i mean they're these, these are kids um but their sense of right and wrong is so like untempered by any anything any 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 kind of authority their authority comes from themselves. I mean, remember we did Lord of the Flies. I mean, this is this is like Lord of the Flies in a way, but broken down, you know, ba balkanized in small gangs and weaponized. And their language reflects the fact that all they do is as they wilt, right? That's all they do. And we have this onomatopoetic language because it's like later on when he's presented with the fact that um, he's been prosecuted. When he gets caught and prosecuted, um, he sees his mother and he says that um, his there there was mom all boo boo you know all boo hooing, right? And that's such a small statement, but it's so brilliant because he is uh, he's both mocking his mother's like reaction to him and how his you know his but it's also like a statement on his his mother's worldview and how he sees it but it's like again it's through a glass darkly like he doesn't understand it or if he understands it he has a conscientious rejection of it he thinks that her crying is like there's no word i don't know what word to use for it it's like it's not stupid it's like it's just like nothing to him. It just doesn't. It just doesn't like mean anything to him. And the way that you know, the, I mean, yeah, we get like the glazies right for the eyes, and we get these, you know, kind of the lyrical, the lyrical content. And we also also notice, um, you know, one thing that this reminds me in a way. It reminds me of um, Lee, of "Song of Myself" by Whitman. Um, one thing Whitman does is. He has a um, a unity of in variety. In other words, "Song of Myself" is a poem about the the great like plethora of all of the things in America. Like as the epic poem, it's described. You know, um, I contain multitudes. He says, "Right, um, are you the president?" But what he does is he'll often, even though Whitman has these long long you know scrolling lines of verse that will take up entire sheafs enti entire you know sort of um quasi biblical roles of you know his own uh version of 
of you know what what the epic means in terms of biblical in terms of the language and the length of begetting right um because he because whitman conscientiously uses that language um and but what he does is although he has this length which is showing the the width and the breadth of uh you know the american experience he will unify it with alliteration so he doesn't rhyme because by by rhyming it would show that there's some kind of order, but there's no there's no order to the speaker and song of myself because it represents like the the like lack of a unifying thing. They haven't they haven't nothing's congealed yet on the continent. But in Clockwork Orange, it shows that like there was order, there was society, and there is a kind of order, but the order is uh, you know, pyramidal, and it's like top down, and um, the people at the bottom, the, the the order is like what they make of it by doing what they want, and he says this like I would say an example of this would be um, he says the stars stabbing right, the stars stabbing, um, very very neat. Uh, he said, dratzing this droog. Belly, bear, pea pod, very, very, raz, draz. Do you see how, do you see how it's like, first of all, it's, it's not only like a kind of a neo cockney rhyming slang, but it's also like the words have a kind of a simplistic rhyme, but, but that is juxtaposed against the, the content because what he's describing here is like utter violence. And I, I mentioned a few minutes ago, that it reminded me of Macbeth, and that's because, um, remember in Macbeth, in Act 1, I think it's Act 1, Scene 2, he says, um, uh, nor bad farewell till he confronted the knave, um, to, nor bad farewell till he um, unseamed him, till he unseamed him from the knave to the chops. So in other words, um, the guy's describing how Macbeth in the heat of battle basically thrust his sword into the guy's uh, belt for his knave, his navel, and unseamed him, right? He cut, he split him up to his, to the chops. The chops are the, the jaws, right? And this is the same thing Alex does with his knife because he split him open like a pea pod, which is, a, which is actually a more disturbing and violent image because we, we imagine, we associate the peas inside the pea pod with this is his gutty woods, right? His guts like literally spilled out. And he takes pride in the sense that his first like slash at this guy um, he didn't, he, he, he was so nimble with his knife work that he like didn't even, he just like got cut his buttons basically, but he didn't even pierce, um, his shirt underneath. Um, and then let's see. Oh, then what happens is they run away. Um, after that, <laughs> this is my favorite scene in the, in the film because I love this monologue. It's one of the most brilliant monologues. He, um, he, they run away because they hear the uh, the Millicents coming, the uh, the coppas, and they they steal a car, uh, Durango ninety five, and they're like, <laughs> they, I mean, this is like this is why the movie's so good because Kubrick is, does this so well because it's obviously you know you're watching like I mean it's it, it's almost like Kubrick was like all right I want this to look like a uh, like a uh, an Alfred Hitchcock movie where they're in the car, you know, they're they're driving along in the car and the they're sitting still, but everything in the background is moving and they're obviously on a set. Um, Tarantino does this, and he did it in I think Kill Bill Two, um, and you know it's just a cinematic illusion. But the way that the Droogs are all four of them are packed into these two seats in the Durango ninety five. There's no top on the car, and it's obviously freezing outside, and they're in England, and, like, <laughs> Alex is, like, you know, doing his Kubrick stare and, like, totally concentrated on the road, and the other Drugs are, like, screaming with joy, um, and, you know, they are, uh, they're ghost riding, right? Do they have the lights on in the car? And what, remember what he says, we fitted, we fitted around with other travelers of the night playing hogs of the road. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm laughing because like, 
what they're doing is just driving the car, playing chicken, and like you see all these cars like going off the side of the road. They almost run over a guy. Then they drive right underneath the lorry. Right, they drive underneath the, and then they, you know, he says, um, you know, if you want to, if you, what does he call it? If you want an an auto, you pluck it from the trees. He says. But this monologue is great, and actually Kubrick punched up this monologue. He says, um, let's see, uh, the, um, let me find the exact part. Um, he says, the autos parked by the Cine weren't all that horror show. Crappy starry vestiges, most of them. But there was a newish Durango 95 that I thought might do. Uh, Durango 95 is also, for you music lovers out there, Durango 95 is the name of the song that um, that uh, the Ramones, it, you know, it's the, is it the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly? It's the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly song that the Ramones um, opened up every show with. Um, it's called Durango 95. I saw the Ramones twice uh, back in the 90s. Um, he says... I turned on the ignition and started her up and she grumbled away real horror show. Uh, uh, so this is what it says in the film. He says, um, the Durango 95 purred away real horror show. A nice, warm, vibrate feeling all through your gutty woods. Then I made, he says, um, we fitted around with uh, other travelers of the night playing hogs of the road. In the book it says, we fitted around what, um, what was called the back town for a bit, scaring old vex and chinas that were crossing the roads and zigzagging after cats and that. <laughs> zigzagging after cats? Okay. Um, then we took the road west. There wasn't much traffic about, so I kept pushing the old Noga through the floorboards near, and the Durango 95 ate up the road like spaghetti. Soon, oh, soon it was winter trees and dark, my brothers, with a country dark. And at one place, I ran over something big with a snarling, toothy rot in the headlamps. Then it screamed and squelched under an old dim in the back near laughed his gulliva, his gulliva off. Ho, 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 at that. Then we saw one young Malchick with his sharp, Lub, uh, lub lubbing under a tree so we stopped and cheered at them then we bashed into them both with a couple of half-hearted tolchocks making them cry and on we went what we were after now was the old surprise visit that was a real kick and good for uh, laughs and and it says in the movie uh, laughs and lashings of the old ultraviolet uh, here he says, good for smacks and lashings of the old ultraviolet. We came at last to a sort of village, and just outside this village was a small sort of cottage on it, uh, on its own with a bit of a garden. The Luna was well up now, and we could vidy the this cottage fine and clear as I eased up and put the brake on, the other three giggling like Bazumni, and we could vidy the name on the gate of this cottage, Vesh, which was home, a gloopy sort of a name. I got out of the auto, ordered my droogs to shush their giggles and act like serious, and I opened this malinky gate and walked up to the front door. I knocked nice and gentle, and nobody came, so I knocked a bit more, and this time I could slushy somebody coming, then a bolt drawn. Then the door inched open an inch or so. Then I could vidy this one glass looking out at me, and the door was on a chain. Yes, who is it? It was a sharps gullos, a young devotchka by her sound. So I said in a very refined manner of speech, a real gentleman's gloss, pardon, madam, most sorry to disturb you, but my friend and, I and me were out for a walk and my friend is taken bad all of a sudden and was a very troublesome turn. And he's out there on the road, dead out and groaning. All right, and, then, and of course the lady, the lady's like, uh, the, the, the lady's like, um, no, I don't believe you. I've heard... Uh, I've heard all of the things about like young hoodlums and travelers of the night out just unleashing absolute mayhem. Dude, these people, these, these dudes are driving around in a stolen car, zigzagging after cats, roiping and slashing um, and driving over like people and animals. They see a couple of Ewoks under a tree, yub nubbing it up. They go over and, you know, give them a few bashes. Then they go to this home. They do a home invasion. I mean, this is absolute mayhem, right? It's what the, it's what the old man was talking about. There's no law and order, right? There's no law and order anymore. And so then they go in and they, um, they do what you might imagine and what you've seen in the film to the lady. Um, and uh, when, when Alex ends up getting in trouble is 
he breaks into the lady's home and she basically runs like a yoga um she runs like a not a Tavistock, but a um what's the other one? The what's the institute? You guys, what's the institute? Um the Ginsburg Institute. Um the one that, oh god, I can't think of it. Oh uh, what is it? Um anyway Esalen. It's like an Esalen Institute. And uh you know, for it's like a Esalen Institute for Yoga Cat Moms, and she's not having any of it. She's already called the uh, the the Coppas, the Millicents, and uh, and Alex breaks in, and of course, in the film, he you know does. There's a there's a interesting thing that Kubrick does, right? Um, which is like when the actual moment of contact occurs, right? The violence. Um, he cuts to like the what is it he cuts to like a Liechtenstein painting, so but I mean it's stark in the film. It's one of, you know everything in the film is so memorable. But what he what he's doing there is he's cutting to this like um, he's cutting to this cartoonish comic book violence scene with like a Batman on a Bonapia, you know soy face scream. But what it's doing is it's saying both the fact it's it's that's showing the fact that again these kids live in a comic book world where nothing is like real. There's no consequences. But it also is doing the Elizabethan, you know, Shakespearean theatrical uh, thing, which is to show the violence off stage because it's much more horrifying for the audience for the viewer and for the reader to imagine the things than it is to see it like on film because we'll we realize that i'm very aware that i'm watching a film here right as peter griffin says um and so it's like left to the imagination but we do know that when he gets to the um when he gets to the police station and uh terrence stamp uh, is there like as the bad cop remember he, he's broken his nose and he shoves his thumb right into his nose right and uh mr deltoid comes in and he finds out uh-uh the woman died sorry now you're up for uh you know now you're up for uh murder one and alex has no like again he it doesn't like really matter to him because in the next part of the of the book he says um, he says, this is like the re he says like, this is the real, like gloopy, sad part of the story. Oh, my brothers. And it's, it's, it's obviously like farcical. It's like, it's a parody of actual like feelings about his incarceration. It, it's almost like, it's, it's almost like cartoonish dissociation. Um, he said, oh, I wrote on this page, page 25, um, the book, uh, the book that, um, the, let's see, oh, the book that the author, by the way, the book that the author is writing at home, because Patrick, is it Patrick Maggi is the author, um, who, like, they break into this guy's house, and he's, there's an author sitting there like an orange, you know, you know, MoMA typewriter, and he's got, you know, and remember they topple all the bookcases, which is also symbolic, right? They're toppling, you know, structure and learning. Uh, and it's just, it's all, there's no feeling. It's all, I mean, there's no thinking. There's no, there's no meditation. Like there's no spirituality, not meditation. I meant meditation on things. There's no like deep thinking. It's all feelings and violence. Um, and they assault the woman, you know, the woman, and they make the dude watch, right? And that's Patrick Maggi. But in the book, the book that he is writing is A Clockwork Orange. It's called A Clockwork Orange. And remember that later on, um, this is like the re uh, sort of eternal return aspect of the book is that uh, Alex ends up back at their house after he's been programmed. And um, remember also that when he gets uh, let out of the treatment, he gets attacked by the homo, hobo demons, hobo demons, um, and the, the David Lynch hobo demons uh, with the old Irishman drinking his culture. Can you spare some culture, me brothers? He says. Um, and remember who picks him up 
it's he gets picked up by two uh, he, you know two fascists, two policemen who take him out to the country and they what do they do? Remember they water they waterboard him. They um, essentially, I mean, they they dunk his head uh, on, you know in a trough and they uh, beat him with their cudgels in the back. But you know who the two policemen are? It's Dim and the other Droog. Now they're the cops. So in other words, the young violent. Who you know, uh, hoodlum droogs have been have found their place in society by being uh, the uh, the thin blue line, right? And they leave him be, and then he staggers through the mucky wilderness and ends up back at home. That's where he ends up back uh, back at home. And of course, that guy has now become he's a paraplegic because he's because of what they did to him, and he's now a you know subversive political writer who disagrees with the methods of the Ludovico treatment, and yet he gaslights Alex into thinking like he doesn't know who he is, and then they do their own reverse Ludovico treatment on him. They tie him, you know, they they won't let him out of the room upstairs, and Alex finds out, this is in the book, that they put the speakers uh, up to the ceiling, and they're playing his programming music, which is uh, Beethoven's Ninth. Right, and that of course makes him go mad because that was the sort of Pavlovian music um, that was used uh, during his treatment. Now, in the book, um, that's a, another one of the differences between uh, Anthony Burgess and Kubrick is that in the book, there's not an emphasis on Beethoven so much. Beethoven's mentioned a few times, and he loves you know Ludwig, but he. It's like he loves classical music. Like he listens to, um, he mentions Mozart. Um, he's there's a bunch of them. I don't think Rachmaninoff, uh, but there's another one, um, and there are a few of them. But he's like, you know, he's a connoisseur of classical music, and that's why uh, he has the argument with Dim. By the way, in the uh, in the crow of a milk bar, because when they're sitting in the bar, um, they see the again the soprano, and she's singing. Um, She's singing uh, Ode to Joy in German. And um, he's, Alex starts to sort of transcend, you know, and uh, Dim, like, makes a rude noise. And Alex immediately, bam, he hits him with his, with his, um, his cane. And he says, what are you going to do that for? I don't like what you did. I'll meet you with cudgel on chain anytime. Or something like that. I forget what he says. And he says, oh, what's that? And then remember they, um, when they are uh, out walking by the by the uh, brutalist lake, that's when Alex like suddenly turns in the ballet like movement of Kubrick's, um, his um, you know da- his his really like dance like uh, choreographed violence, and he it's brilliant because when he turns to kick. Um, I think Dim, who falls into the water, right? He obviously, like, the stage combat of it is, like, his, you know, his Doc Martens are obviously not <laughs> making actual contact with him. And and I think that it's, it because it's so obvious, you know, it's like Kubrick b- was saying, you know, we're not making any attempt to have anything realistic in terms of violence in this scene. This is going to be um, a choreograph scene where the violence is uh, there's almost again there's a, a dissociation between the characters it's like he's kicking him but he's not really kicking him and we can see that so we have a kind of a a um reverse uh coleridge um what is the, what's the coleridge phrase um a uh a what is he what's coleridge say about um watching shakespeare uh the uh, will uh, willing suspension of disbelief. Sorry, we have a, our willing suspension of disbelief, like goes into reverse because we 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 be- we believe that we don't believe what we're watching. Also, Alex's kicks mirror his singing in the rain choreography when he does the same at the house and when they first break into the house and he assaults the woman. Remember, he's kicking, singing in the rain, bam, bam, and he kicked and he, and he does that. I don't want to be too graphic, um, even though it's in the book. Um, and let's see. On page... 
Uh, oh, on page, let's see, 27. Again, we get these mentions of uh, the Shelly mask. Um, we get, okay, so uh, page, pages 30 and 31, there's an interesting passage about the out-of-body experience of the synth mask, right? Of the, the drug that the milk is laced with, this synthetic masculine um, that, you know, the sort of Huxley come alive in a novel. Um, and not and not in a brave new world. This is like a brave new. This is like a brave new hell world, right? It's even it's it's a, it, they're both hellscapes. This and brave new world, and it, you know, and but this one is like a is a different sort of surrealist version of it. He says, uh, he says, let's see, we got out at center and walked slow back to the Corova Milk Bar, all going yaw a melanky bit of exhibiting to moon and star and lamplight our, our back fillings because we were still only growing Malchicks and had school in the daytime. They got school tomorrow. It's a school night. It's a school night. Look at all this shit they've done on a school night. It's terrible. And when we got into the Corova, we found it fuller than when we left earlier on, but the Chelovac that had been burbling away uh, in the land on white and synthamask or whatever, on white, I think the white is uh, Chochabamba. He mentions cocaine a few times um, in the text here because um, that's what the elites are doing. And again, it's what the elites are doing at the Corova Milk Bar and it's what is being trafficked um, in the prison. In the land on white and, uh, and synthamask or whatever was still on at it going urchins of dead cost in the way ho ga hey glil platonic time weatherborn. Platonic time. Let me make it confirm. Um, it was probable that this. It was probable that this was his third or fourth lot that evening. For he had that pale, inhuman look, like he'd become a thing, and like his litzo was really a piece of chalk carved. Really, if he wanted to spend so long in the land, he should have gone into one of the private cubies at the back and not stayed in the big mezzo, because here are some of the Malchicks would filly about with him and Malenki bit, though not too much because there were powerful bruise boys hidden away in the old Corova who could stop any riot. Uh, those are the bouncers. Anyway, Dim squeezed in next to this vac and with his big clown's y uh, yawp that showed his hanging grape, he stabbed this vex foot with his own large filthy sabog. But the vec, my brothers, heard not, being now all above the body. So the dude is on Synthamask and Dim walks up and stabs him in the foot and he is totally out of body. He doesn't even feel it. Right? And he says that there are private cubicles in the back for people doing this shit. Right? Um, and the guy is turned chalky white like a, like a, I don't know, I guess he's got the big, uh, big Arduino eyes. Right? And he's, um, he's gone total, he's gone total uh, psychic spy astral projection. Right? It was Nad Sats mostly milking and coking. There you go. There's a cocaine reference. And, fit, and fitting around, Nad Sats were what we used to call the teen. But there were a few of the more starry ones, Vex and Chinas alike, but not of the bourgeois, never them, laughing and cavorting at the, at the bar. You could tell them from their barberings and loose platies, big stringy sweaters mostly, that they'd been on rehearsal at the TV studios around the corner. The Devotchkas among them had these very lively litzos and big... Wide rots, very red, showing a lot of teeth and smacking away and not caring about the wicked world one whit. That's the alliteration. And then the disc on the stereo twanged off and out. It was Johnny Zhivago, a rusky kushka, singing only every other day. And in the like interval, the short silence before the next one came on, one of the Devochkas, very fair and with a big smiling red rot, and in her late 30s, I'd say, suddenly came with a burst of singing, only a bar and a half as though she was like giving an example of something they'd all been cavorting about. And it was like, for a moment, oh, my brother, some great bird had flown into the milk bar. And I felt all the little malenky hairs on my plot standing in wise, the shivers crawling up like slow malenky lizards and then down again, because I knew what she sang. It was from an opera by Friedrich uh, Gifterfenster called Das Betzug. And it was the bit where she's snuffing it with her throat cut. And the Slavos are better like this, maybe. Anyway, I shivered. Wow, it's crazy. His lyrical, his lyrical interpretation of this, of this song, right? It's almost more lyrical than the, 
the lyrics of the song that we're hearing. And then because it's a school night, Alex has, Alex has got to make his way back to the uh, back to the crib. So he says, um, he says, let's see. So we went off, uh, this is page 35. So we went our several ways, me belching arg on the cold Coke I peed it. I had my coat threat Britva handy in case any of Billy Boy's droogs should be around near the flat block waiting. And for that matter, any of the other bandas or gruppas or, or shakas that from time to time were at war with one. Where I lived was with my dada and mom in the flats of municipal flat block 18A. <laughs> right? Municipal flat block 18A. Nameless, you know, enumerized total shit. Total shit world. All concrete. Right? There's there's one there's like one Well, there's a window in the kitchen. Remember Remember later on in the film when the the, the mom his dad and mom, and the mom comes home, and the song is playing. I want to marry a lion housekeeper and live by the side of the sea. It's like, it's like, it's like. Okay, you know, we're seeing this parody of what the fifties like wholesome home was, but but in a you know purple haired factory work, uh, you know flat cube in a you know in iso cube city where alex has like three padlocks on his door and doesn't go to school and he's got a you know he's got the window with uh ludwig van like on the on the window shade and he's got his little he's got he's got his little mini disc players right and he plays he plays um ludwig and he's got you know his, his snake shots out to tgf out there with his you know with snake ludwig and um and he floats off and he's got the, you know, even his like, even the, the bedspread that he has, the duvet is like, got these weird psychedelic little pyramids on it. Have you noticed that? Um, it's like a, it's like a weird MoMA version of, you know, okay, this is the globus, this is the globalist world and you got your little play pyramids on your bed. Feel safe and comforted in knowing that, you know, everything's as it should be in Alex's world, right? Um, so I just want to, for the rest of this, um, I'm going to start to wind it down here, but what I'm going to uh, discuss is, I mean, I, we could go long on this because there's so much to, it. I mean, we haven't even gotten into the conditioning yet into the, um, into the mind control. And, um, and also, um, I want to cover the priest monologue here and then what happens to Alex afterwards. So before I do that, let me, um, take a look at the super chats see if we have any super chats here uh show my sticker activity show my super chats come on now so, give me a second y'all i'm new i'm new to super chats so i gotta figure out how to check them um somebody show me where to find this you guys because it doesn't show my super chats on here how do I find my super chats? Come on now. It's gonna be real embarrassing if um if I can't see everybody's super chats. Cause I know I got some. Shouts out to Jeff out there. Homeboy Jethro. Everybody follow homeboy Jethro on Instagram. Um Jeth says uh Jeth Super Chats um nine ninety nine and says, cheers on 1K and monetization, my droog, my little droogy. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate you, homeboy. Um, shouts out to Penny out there. I uh, saw that super chat earlier. Um, let's see. You guys, I'm sorry. It's embarrassing. I'm trying to figure out my super chats. Why doesn't it show it? Why doesn't it show it where it says viewer activity and super chats? And then I open the tab. And in this one, hold on, let me refresh it. Um, see if I got any super chats on this page right here. Give me a second, y'all. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Here we go. I got it. I got it, y'all. Sorry, I'm boomer teching. Yo, shouts out to DJ, our homeboy out there, 
uh, Day Jire DJ, who sends seven ninety nine um, Ozbucks and sends three celebratory emojis. Cheers! Thank you so much out there, DJ. Appreciate you. Um, again, shouts out to our homeboy Jethro who sends nine ninety nine, and he said, "Cheers on the one k of monetization." Well, you know what? Um, it's thanks to everybody. Thank you, um, everybody. Thanks. Send their thanks. Give your love to our homeboy Jethro out there because my homeboy Jethro and Jerry, our homeboy Jerry and Exposing Powerful Lies live streams are um, my two friends who uh, really got got me going in this. Um, big, big time, good friends and supporters and I uh, wouldn't even, wouldn't even um, have the channel if it wasn't for those two. So thank you very much to both of those and both of those fellas and thank you to Jethro so much for all of your love and support. Appreciate your homeboy. Shouts out to Penny out there. Love you, Penny. Excellent pronunciation of Aura. That pronunciation right there was pretty bad. Sorry. <laughs> Shouts out to Penny, who was enjoying her steak and eggs earlier. Based Penny. Um, Shouts out to uh, Talita Dudley. I hope I got your name right. Who sends, let's see. She sent um, 10 Kiwi bucks and, sh and said, um, I think you do a great Cockney London accent. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. That's really cool. Thank you. Yo, shouts out to Kristen out there. Slow boy whiteboard. Uh, our bassist, slow boy whiteboard, Kristen, who says, just testing out the super chats. Congratulations. Appreciate you. Thank you so much, Kristen. Always big supporter. Everybody go to slow boy whiteboard. Everybody here is already in slow boy whiteboard. I'm sure. Um, Dr. Crunchy Johnson. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kristen. Shouts out to Maddie. Shouts out to Maddie out there. Real Cooter Brown at uh, Digital Minefield. Maddie, the Real Cooter Brown, who says, do you have any thoughts on if the ultraviolence of the book predicted the violence that permeated the British youth cultures of the 20th century with, this, with the skinheads and the football firms? Right. Rangers. Um, yeah, great question. Uh, and sends nine bucks, nine ninety nine. Thank you so much, Maddie. Really appreciate you. Yo, great question. Great question, Maddie. Uh, astute question. Um, yes, I think that. I think, in a sense, that the uh, the book and really the film um, both commented on and influenced the way that um, f you know football uh, culture was going. I mean, that's. That's that's been a thing for a long time. So, um, uh, you know, and it's sort of inherent in in uh, football culture. And of course, you know, I'd say that you know, with sports ball culture in general, you know, we see it. Obviously, we see it here. To, um, but kind of, I don't want to say to a lesser extent, but in a in a completely different way. And that's because of the geography and the climate. Um, of European, especially British football, you know, especially English uh, football. Um, and of course, uh, I've got a great book on, um, got a great book on uh, football, on, um, on soccer here, um, a, a book on Brazilian football. And um, it's sort of cultural implications. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting is how the uh, football clubs, you know, and social groups are, I don't know if they're, I don't know if co-opted is the right word, but are cer are certainly incorporated into a, um, a f sort of a uh, kind of a form of low intensity warfare, right? I mean, for instance, the best example of that, I mean, most people would think of, you know, the Chelsea headhunters and, and, and all that. Arsenal, remember that scene in Eastern Promises? Arsenal, um, where the guy, you know, the the Russian kid, um, the ass assassin, is going to the Ar uh, Arsenal match, and he gets um, he gets a Colombian necktie slash, uh, you know, Glasgow smile in a uh, cemetery, you know, as he's as he's desecrating a cemetery, right? Um, walking the football match, and he he gets he gets whacked. Uh, but the best example of this, um, I think, would definitely be um, Rangers and Celtic, right? Because because that's where the Northern Irish troubles sort of come to a head in a 
you know, supposedly, supposedly peaceful context in terms of like, you know, you're watching Normie TV and you see, you know, you're watching the Boomer TV and you see the football match. Um, and yet you have these two, you have a sectarian conflict like at the very edge, right? So I think, um, but I think it's in terms of like how it went with the 90s, especially the 80s and 90s, it, in many ways, you know, it, it certainly mimics and mirrors the way that Clockwork Orange, especially this, the, the cinema of Clock, Clockwork Orange works, right? It's, it's almost the same work. I mean, because like I was saying at the beginning, Clockwork Orange is like, this is now. You know, it's, it's with, with football or without, it's now. Um, but it's certainly, I mean, you could say actually that, you know, his uh, ballet kicks and his singing in the rain is almost like a soccer kick, right? It's almost like he's kicking his soccer ball. Um, but he is unleashing ultra violence. So that's a great question. I, I hope I, I don't know, I hope I address that in, a, in some sort of a coherent manner. Thank you to Maddie. Really appreciate you. Um, yo, shouts out to Jason again for that $5 super chat. Woohoo, BLA. Here's a super chat. Shouts out to Maddie for that $4.99. Congratulations on the monetization um, to the most well read man around. Well, thank you. I don't know about that last part. I'm just a. Uh, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just trying to get things in the old skull here. I'm just a simple man. Um, so thank you, Maddie. Really appreciate that. Uh, so, yo, I figured that out. All right. So, um, so what I'm going to do now is discuss the priest's monologue. Whoa, shouts out for that 20 bucks from Pim. Um, hey. LBG, great stream. I know that you read some Burroughs. Do you think there's any validity in the claim that he was positioned to be CIA director, but he got railroaded? Interesting. Um, yeah, I've got, I know Burroughs work really well. Um, I mean, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not trying to make a statement. I'm just saying, um, just on the surface, I guess. I know Burroughs work really well. I've read, um, I've read Ted Morgan's biography of Burroughs, Literary Outlaw. I've read it twice. I've read, um, the Yage letters, the Yahe letters. Um, I've read uh, Word Virus, uh, Burroughs Selected Letters, Inner Zone, um, what is it, Nova Express, Naked Lunch. Jun I've read Junkie like three times. I've read, um, what else? Um, his letters with, with uh, Ginsburg, Paul Bowles. Um, I've done a lot of reading into his later life in New York, his sort of latter life in New York. I've seen all of his readings. I have all of his recordings. Um, and I think that one thing about Burroughs is that he was a brilliant, he was a brilliant man. I mean, he, you know, he was, he was extremely high IQ in the sense of like the literal IQ. Um, he was, uh, you know, he was, he was a brilliant guy. Um, but he was totally twisted, and he. I think my my views on Burroughs, my view of Bur Burroughs is that, and all of the work, you know, they they hint at this, but I think that, um, and there's no there's no like definitive proof, but you know, he went to uh, Los Alamos school. His granddad was uh, you know Burroughs, the adding machine. He lived on a on a trust fund, and that doesn't mean anything in terms of all that can just be totally upfront. But he was certainly tied in with intelligence in a number of ways, especially through Harvard and um, and through Ginsburg, right? With um, Ginsburg being the uh, the king of May, right, in the um, Velvet Revolution. He was able to live abroad. I've got another great book about him, uh, right? Uh, it's called The Beat Hotel. Um, oh, yeah, it's right here. Uh, here's the Anglo-American Establishment. Um uh, this book right here is called, this is, a, this is a good book. It's called The Beat Hotel. And it's about um, Gregory Corso, William Burroughs, and um, Allen Ginsberg and their life in Paris in uh, 1957, 1963. And, you know, I think that a lot of the um, Burroughs work seems to tie in with intelligence ties. I don't think that he was ever asked to be head of, any intelligence agency. There's no way. Um, and that's because, first of all, his lifestyle, and that's not to say that these people aren't degenerate on their own, but his lifestyle was one of, 
I mean, he was, you know, he was a heroin addict. He really was. And, uh, and I think that um, that is, you know, yes, all these people are compromised, but um, he was compromised in, in so many ways that were out, out in the open. Right. I mean, read the go back and read the the Yage letters, the Yahe letters. And Burroughs was one of the first people to go to South America and do um, ayahuasca. And so, you know, that that ties in with a lot of the, especially a lot of stuff that Jay has covered. But I think that with Burroughs, he you know, his book exposes some of the other creeper activities that he was doing. And it's just too it's just too he there was no interest with him in terms of anything in terms of like. Uh, upfront geopolitics or grand chessboard. Um, you know, I'm sure he, I'm sure, again, I'm sure he was an asset or funded, but I don't think he would be any um, uh, intelligence director. So thank you for that question. That was a great question. Um, thanks to um, D. Allman, our Allman brothers, homeboy out there for all the support. And he sends 990, 9, 9.99. He says, congrats on the 1K and take this. And take this as long as you can. Kanks, appreciate you. Thank you so much, homeboy. I really appreciate you. Thank you for that 999. So yeah, if you want to send a super chat, um, or if you want to support me, if you want to donate through uh, Cash App, Venmo, PayPal, all those things, you can still do that. Hit the links there in the video description, the channel description, um, and you can super chat anytime. So thank you so much, so much. Uh, and thanks to y'all for chilling with me on this spooktober night. Ooh, it's so, you guys... You guys, it's <laughs> you. <laughs> oh, you guys, it's so cool and crisp outside. Oh, I walked outside and had a pumpkin spice latte, and oh, I just said, oh, it's so cool and crisp. I love the fall. Look at the leaves. <laughs> now I walked outside and uh, lit up a Marlboro Medium and drank me some uh, GMOs and said, "Dang, look at the leaves changing." Then a hawk flew by and I looked in his eyes and. I caught a glimpse, a little glint in his eyes. He flew over me, and he made that little, he made that bird call, and I recognized the, the voice of my ancestors crying to me, hovering above me from afar. But he knew that I was the alpha in the situation, and he flew off. So, anyway, all right. So, um, page one hundred seven. This is the priest's monologue in church, uh, not in church, in prison, um, to Alex uh, when Alex talks about the Ludovico treatment. He says, it says, okay, sorry, on page 106, um, and this is great because this is one of the absurd uh, things about the book is that, of course, when he's in prison, he is um, <laughs> six double five three two one. That's his name in prison. He is a number, not a name. And that's, that's, that is a thing, right? He is a number now. But in a sense, everyone in their world is in, well, to, 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 you know, who is like a number, right? Uh, <laughs> enumerated the internet of things but to him this this is like on the surface he says ah little six double five three two one be seated um then he spoke in a very like earnest way to me saying one thing i want you to understand boy is that this is nothing to do with me were it expedient i would protest about it but it is not expedient there is the question of my own career. There is the question of the weakness of my own voice when set against the shout of certain more powerful elements in the polity. Do I make myself clear? It's interesting how he can't even name the people, and he's in the book, right? He didn't, brothers, but I nodded that he did. Very hard ethical questions are involved, he went on. You are to be made into a good boy, Six double five three two one. Never again will you have the desire to commit acts of violence or to offend in any way whatsoever against the state's peace. The state's peace. I hope you take all that in. I hope you're absolutely clear in your own mind about that. I said, and by the way, notice the diction. Notice how the diction completely changes, right? The diction completely changes because we have the very like earnest way. He's, I love how he says that the earnest way that this guy is speaking to him in a truthful way that really no one else in his world has ever spoken to him with an honest and genuine care for his, for his life and his, his soul um, and for what he intends to do with his life. You know, I mean, because even, you know, all the other people like, especially Deltoid, the creeper caseworker, they all speak to him like with, you know, ulterior motives. 
Oh, it will be nice to be good, sir. But I had a real horror show smack at that inside, brothers. <laughs> he said, it may not be nice to be good. It may not be nice to be good, little six double five three two one. It may be horrible to be good. This is this is an incredible passage. And when I say that to you, I realize how self-contradictory that sounds. I know I shall have many sleepless nights about this. What does God want? Does God want goodness or the choice of goodness? Is he a man who chooses the bad, perhaps in some way better than a man who has the good imposed upon, upon him? Deep, deep and hard questions, little 655321. But all I want to say to you now is this. If at any time in the future you look back to these times and remember me, the lowest and humblest of all God's serv servitors, do not, I pray, think evil of me in your heart, thinking me in any way involved in what is now about to happen to you. And now, talking of praying, I realize, sadly, that there will be little point in praying for you. You are passing now to a region where you will be beyond the reach of the power of prayer, a terrible, terrible thing to consider. And yet, in a sense, in choosing to be deprived of the ability to make an ethical choice, you have, in a sense, really chosen the good. So I shall like to think. So God help us all, Six double five three two one. I shall like to think. And then he began to cry. But I didn't really take much notice of that, brothers, only having a bit of a quiet smack inside because you would vidy that he had been peeding away at the old whiskey. And now he took a bottle from a cupboard in his desk and started to pour himself a real horror show bolshy slog into a very greasy and grashny glass. He downed it and then said, all may be well, who knows? God works in a mysterious way. Then he began to sing away at a hymn in a real loud, rich galoss. Then the door opened and the cassos came in to talk me back to my bonny cell. But the old Charles still went on singing this hymn. That, I love that passage. I mean, like, it's so, I mean, that's, you know, I think one thing that strikes me about that that passage, you know, the, the Charlie's monologue there is that, um, you know, he's not saying, um, he's speaking with authority, right? And I don't, I, I'm just talking about the character and what the, and what, you know, the, the speaker is doing here. The, the, the guy is speaking with authority and he's speaking in earnest, but he's also looking at, you know, the other side of this, which is that, you know, the, the thing that he says to him about, look, you're walking into something where you're going to be deprived of your will and you should know that, right? You should know that and you should know what that means and you probably can't even understand it. And of course, the thing to consider here is that Alex is in the big house, like with the big boys, right? He's in the big, he's in the, he's in the clink, um, you know, because of his, his, his ripe and his uh, muck duck, right? <laughs> and um and yet he is still a kid right and th he's about to volunteer himself for something of which he has no real understanding and that you know it's like he's trying to explain to him as best he can that this is what's going to happen to you and it's not going to be pleasant because your whole world has been pleasant and you know you you're going to have to make a a real hard choice here and have a dark night of the soul in in a way that's different from how most people consider a dark night of the soul in that you probably don't even know that you have a soul in the first place and you're going to find out that you have a soul and then it's going to be you know for all intents and purposes taken away from you in the sense that they're going to deprive you of your ability to decipher right and wrong and to make any decisions. So everything in your life that you've always done, which is, you know, uh, uh, offensively, um, you know, Alex lives according to the basest of passions, right? Um, it's all drugs, assault, murder, and absolute mayhem. And he just lives uh, in the moment, right? Obviously. And that's kind of watering it down, I know, but but I'm just trying to to put this in in terms like we can kind of understand um, in a simplistic manner, I guess. And he's you know he he he's always done that, and now he's going to find out that those things are separate from him because he's going to live in it like a shell 
of his body where he has a mind, but he's been completely broken. And now that also brings to mind like the, the fact that, well, what they're doing to this guy, I mean, this guy, he's like the worst guy. He's the worst, right? But the question is, is this inhuman to do? Well, yes. It, I mean, the, the answer to the question is yes, it is inhuman, right? Um, that's the whole point. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean that the conflict doesn't come to the mind of the reader, right? Uh, because of the sort of the moral quandary in which you find yourself in the midst of this. And that's one of the brilliant things that Burgess does is, you know, that, you know, it introduces this conflict in the mind of the reader in, in that if you find yourself sympathizing with this character, you can't. And it's hard not to because, you know, he's a kid. Uh, he's about to have horrible things happen to him. Um, but he's a totally unsympathetic character because he's absolute, he's a demon. And in fact, uh, that's brought up uh, by Deltoid in the book and the movie because Delta, remember Deltoid says, is it some devil that crawls inside of you? And I think that's, you know, that is absolutely the best, one of the most important and revelatory things in the book in that there's no real other way to describe Alex and his activities other than to say that he is, um, he's like, tr I mean, he's truly demonic. And, Again, that's one of the illusory things about the book and where we, we're led as readers because you you get into, Al it's because it's in the first person, you get into Alex's mindset that all of the things that happen to him are temporary. And you have to remember that, you know, that it's a world. Obviously, it's not a real world because we're reading a book and watch and you, you watch the film, but it is a real world. And, and then again, it's even more than that because this is the world now. I mean, in, in what way is this not the world, right? I mean, this is exactly what they did. Remember with the, uh, the plutonium, plutonium-backed uh, stabbies? Remember all that? Uh, remember when um, Bubba apologized for it? Like on camera, right? Uh, I mean, th that's all been exposed. And so we know that this happens with a number of other things that I can't name here, but... Um, anybody who does any sort of cursory reading of this will know about this. And so I think that it's, it's really, it's amazing. It's amazing that, uh, the book is put in these terms and that we have this, we have this sort of conflict going on. Yo, yeah. Shouts out to, uh, Hillbilly, Hillbilly Jack Wagon. Shouts out to you, homeboy. Shouts out to Pim also. Good night. And, um, yeah, you can always catch me on the replay. Come back to the replay. If you're watching this, um, later, thank you for being here and thank you for being here now. I appreciate y'all. Um, okay, so uh, moving on to the uh, T O R T U R E. Obviously, what they do is they how dare you, how dare you? Big Nine was an insult. I can't even say it. I don't know if I should say it. inside y'all. Big Nine, how dare you? But my my Bubba sounds more like Doctor Phil, <laughs> right? Listen. I know, <laughs> it's not even a good Dr. Phil. Listen, y'all, I know that what this lady is going through is real, okay? <laughs> you're done, you're done. You guys, you gotta look up, you gotta look up the Dr. Phil You're Done episode. <laughs> um, uh, Nick Mullen pointed out that the thing that, um, I think it was Nick Mullen, pointed out that the thing that, did I say this already in another stream? The thing that, Dr. Phil does brilliantly is that he maybe it was JD said this um, the thing Dr. Phil does that's pretty brilliant is it's like you know you're watching a uh, you know you're watching this huckster or whatever you know and he's on the you know he's on the boomer TV but one thing he really he does is that when he finds these people like when he presents the people and you know they have their issues like the ear done girl he always presents the solution to them as if it's the logical choice to do the exact opposite of what they were doing. And they always walk away like that. And I know it's, you know, scripted TV, but it is pretty, pretty brilliant how that ends up. Listen, I know 
I know that you have DID MPD, okay? But wouldn't it make sense if you didn't, okay? <laughs> um, so one of the things, another stark difference between the book and the film is that in the film, um, Alex, the, the what he witnesses, remember they, they tie him up in a straitjacket and they uh, put the, you know, they put the things in his eyes, you know, and um, they make him watch the films. And of course, they're giving the they're giving him um, the stabbies uh, in addition to that. Um, and then they're playing the, you know, Beethoven so that they can, you know, condition him. But they're showing films. They start off by showing films of, and they do this in the book, um, they're showing films of the old in-out and the ultraviolet. And they start off, like, with the normal things. And he kind of gets a kick out of it. He's like, oh, I wish I was doing that. And then there's an instance where they show, um, like, his mama, uh, it happening to her. And it's pretty brilliant the way Kubrick does it because, like, the the actors the actors in the film that they show Alex look, are it, it, it's probably the same actor like it's the same actress that plays his mom right um, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong I don't know if that's the case but looks a lot like her and so that the question I have and you know the question that I would ask would be okay well these people these are these are sick people okay. The people are sick enough to do this as their, you know, human ex uh, experimentation. Um, so, would it be beyond their bounds to um, essentially have uh, an eight millimeter esque film that they show Alex? Why wouldn't it be the actual people? Why wouldn't they be doing the things they're doing in the filmed version to Alex? And that that's pretty brilliant. What Kubrick does, what uh, especially Kubrick does in the film, because. What he's sh what he's saying is that like the the things the activities the 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 mayhem that Alex uh, does every night um, all of the activity th that he does is like choreographed so it's almost cinematic but the but the versions that he watches on the film within the film seem real they seem more real or hyper real so that. They probably are. It's like he's looking through the looking glass and he's seeing reality mirrored back at him. Does that make sense? Um, and of course, the culmination is the um, the Brandenburg uh, movement, and you know the the uh, the what is it? The Queen Mary march. You know, the, the, the I mean, I haven't even even mentioned the soundtrack to the film, which is like one of the best soundtracks of all time. Right? It's Wendy Carlos um, doing "Switched on Bach." Right. It's like synthesize. It's it's, you know, we said in the Apocalypse Now stream, you know, my, my buddy and I were like, this is one of the first movies with synths. But of course, you know, my friend Paul shouts out to Paul, corrected us and was like, dude, Clockwork Orange, of course. And that's not the first one. Um, and he said that. But um, this is like one of the major films this is early 70s where they have a total synthetic um, sym synthetic symphonia so that. It, it, it like mirrors this hyper real version of a, a techno world, right? You have classical music set to a synth, so there's like a distance created between the human and the art, but it also is like a somatized version of like, oh, now you live in the artwork that these people have created for you. I mean, that's what, that's exactly what, that really comes from Brave New World, remember, because in Brave New World, um, they go to the ORG IES, and um, they take their Soma, and they have a, a synthetic, they call it synthetic um, symphonic music in the text, right? Um, so, yeah, in the film, um, they show him uh, films of uh, Hortler walking along at, um, uh, Nerdberg, right? And they're playing the march, and then he he watches the the films of the of those um, let's call them summer camps. Uh, and in the book, um, calling them summer camps for the algo. In the book, he actually watches the uh, Japanese version of that, right? So he says, I do not wish to describe, brothers, what other horrible veshes I was like forced to video that afternoon. Also, the, f the fact that he says, 
that he uses the word bitty instead of see or view mimics the film cinematic vision that Alex exists in. In other words, his eyes are like cameras. So there's a distance between himself and his experience and the experiences that he's undergoing. It's like he's watching a film. So then when he watches the film within the film, it's like he's watching a film within a film within a film. The like, um, he says, uh, in the white coats, and remember there was this Devochka twiddling with the knobs and watching the meters. They must have been more cali and filthy than any prestupnik in the Stasia itself because I did not think of it was possible for any Vec to even think of making films of what I was forced to video, all tied to this chair and my glazies made to be wide open. All I could do was creech very gronky for them to turn it off, turn it off. And that like part drowned the noise of dratsing and filling and also the music that went with it all. You can imagine it was like a terrible relief when I videoed the last bit of film and this Dr. Brodsky said in a very yawny and bored like gloss, I think that should be enough for day one, don't you? Um... He, on page 121, he starts to feel the body shock because they're, they are, uh, they are the, they, they're, they're like, I don't know, they, they, they're, they're conditioning his body to react to the way that his mind should find things repugnant, right? Um, and he starts to feel that because he starts to regurgitate. He says he's going to be sick. Um, and that is like sort of that really that's the instance of his free will leaving his leaving his mind but it's also him finding a natural repugnance to things but he's he's losing choice um page 127 is the mention of sin there's actually a mention of sin um and it goes along with uh, um beethoven and they show him the uh, it's the Brandenburg March in the film, and they show him the um, the Nazi, the or oh, sorry, the uh, the Natsack um, film of the camp of the spe uh, special camp, and he even says it was like the um, uh, s certain symbol. He says that all the lads at school love to draw, and they showed him that in correlation with with the things that they're showing. Um, Let's see. Uh, they mentioned the dialect of the tribe on page 129, which is the tribe of youth um, and the droogs. And they mention it. They say it's old Cockney rhyming slang, gypsy talk, um, Slavic propaganda, and they call it subliminal penetration. So it's sub sub subliminal penetration in the sense that um, what I think that's saying is that Basically, it's co-opted. It's a uh, culture-created vernacular to uh, balkanize society with these gangs of low-intensity warfare youths. Um, page 131 mentions the heresy of the age of reason and the Enlightenment, but they mean it in, the, in, the, in a different way. They mean that it's heretical to uh, deny the, the values of the Enlightenment but what you actually get is you realize reading it the, what you already know, which is that, no, the Enlightenment itself is heretical, right? Um, and the, let's see, Alex's speech on page 130E. He says, but sirs, sirs, I see that it's wrong. It's wrong because it's against, like, society. It's wrong because, and when I say, when I say um, that the Enlightenment is heretical, I I think that should be obvious in terms of the um well i won't get into that i won't get into that um it's wrong because every beck on earth has the right to live and be happy without being beaten and tall chalked and knifed i've learned a lot oh really i have but dr brodsky had a lo loud long smack at that showing all his white zoobies and said the heresy of an age of reason or some such slavos i see what is right and approve but i do what is wrong no, no, my boy, you must leave it all to us, but be cheerful about it. It will soon be all over. In less than a fortnight now, you'll be a free man. Then he patted me on the plecho. In other words, uh, yeah, w um, the Committee for Public Safety uh, and Robespierre are going to decide what is right for society, right? They are the new gods, Um uh, you know, we're going to we're going to get rid of everything and call every, you know, we're going to have Thermidor 
and we're going to have a total bloodbath and depop. And um, then we'll decide what's right because um, we know is what he's saying. Um, Stabbies are mentioned on page 133 and, if, and he gets his freedom, but it's the freedom to walk to the Chamber of Horrors because on the last day of his conditioning, they don't tie him up and take him there. They, they say, no, you're free to go. You're free to um, go to your... You're free to go to your monarch programming. And, um, of course, he walks there on his own because now he doesn't even realize that he's been conditioned to do so and he's walking into his own chamber of horrors. Um, let's see. Um, uh, page 135, it says, there's a mention of turning the other cheek. He says, um, He says that he thought about turning the other cheek, but it's because he... Because they've conditioned him to when he's getting beaten up, when he leaves the prison, um, they beat, they basically punch him in the face, and then he presents the other, uh, the other cheek for them to punch because he doesn't know anything else. He doesn't do it out of grace or virtue or goodwill. He does it because he is now absolutely terrified and weak of his own violence and violence itself. Um, let's see. Um, Page. Oh, he gets on page uh, 151. He gets back. I'm just barreling through now. On um, page 151. Um, and he uh, and he gets back to his. He gets back to his family, and they've replaced him. They've replaced him with a um a guy named Joe, who is a like, you know, he's a working man, and um. He basically says, like, no, you're not wanted here. Look what you've done to your uh, mom and dad. Um, and Alex wants to stand up to him and fight him. Um, and his parents tell him, no, no, we can't. We can't let you back in the home. I mean, Joe's paying rent here. and There's nowhere. There's no place for, for you to stay. You got to go. And so the conflict here is like, well, you know, it's like, well, he, he should be welcome back to his family, right? They're his family. On the other hand, like, He's got to go. I mean, he can't continue living there and going back to the way that he did things before. And Joe is right. But then we learn later on that Joe, the new, the new lodger at the house, um, has like, has he been killed? He's been killed in a, he was assaulting somebody and he got killed. So he's not good either. Um, Joe, oh no, yeah, Joe, Joe uh, got killed by the cops, which is actually probably dim. And Billy Boy, um, but I, uh, I forget what he was doing when he did that. Um, and the question of to get better, to get worse is, he actually, this is a conscientious illusion um, by, by Burgess to, um, he's alluding to the, the Oscar Wilde quote, right, which is, um, in the poem, is the Ballad of Red and Gale. Every man kills uh, the thing that he loves. Some do it with a sword. Uh, what does he say? Some do it with a sword. Some do it with a word. Um, so he is, he. But the thing that he's killing is he's killing the um, the part of him. He's p killing the part of himself that is the only thing that he knew, right? And then, of course, he gets. I already mentioned he gets um, taken in by the. Uh, he gets he gets taken in by the people that he assaulted before, in the book, and then um, they turn against him. And chapter 21, which is the final chapter of the book, which is, again, not in the film and not in the, um, not in the uh, uh, American version of the text, he um, goes and he hangs out with his friends and he says he, like, he, he basically, his friends are like, you know, why won't you share any of the loot with us? And he says, because I earned this loot. And they say, they bring up a good point. They say, this is a precision of language. They say, well, did you earn it or did you, did you take it, right? And so now we get this, we get something that we didn't get in any other parts of the book, which is Alex, it's showing the process of Alex growing up and learning the difference between taking and earning and he chooses, it's like train spotting, right? I chose life, right? In the end, he chooses life. And so it becomes this sort of anti-fable because it's clearly, it doesn't reflect 
the true the truth or the real reality of what it, what happens to him and his changes and it's becomes a sort of a surrealistic fable into oh he grows up and he um learns the error of his ways except the the sinister part of this in the book is that nothing really changes right society hasn't changed they went through political changes but they didn't go through any kind of spiritual changes um the government that sponsored the ludovico treatment ends up um ends up like losing the election and then the new guys come in but nothing's really changed and so alex's changes are you know superficial they're all sort of temporary so uh that's about it that is clockwork orange you guys um i think we covered that you know i think i covered everything i wanted to cover in there um there's a lot to cover i mean we could you know there are endless analyses um there are endless analyses of the, uh, especially of the film, and um, and you know, I, I mean, the symbolism in the film is is amazing and and sort of always rewarding, and I think the text is rewarding because um, there's so much contrast right between the book and the film, and the it's weird because again it sort of flips back on itself because the contrast is only a comparison. Um, in terms of the differences that we see, we have to compare with our own lives and the way that we live, you know, the, in the world in which we find ourselves. And I think that this is a really good, this is a really good, um, not mimicking, but a, uh, a realization, a sort of a proto realization of the world to come and the world in which we find ourselves. So. I'm sure this is, you know, I'm sure this is Carl Schwabsky's, uh, one of his favorite books, right? Especially he sits there at the uh, Corova Milk Bar drinking his Drencrum uh, on Synthamask and just fantasizing about his youth as uh, Alex DeLarge, right? So anyway, that's about all I got, y'all. Um, let me see if we got anything else in Super Chats. Thank you so much again, everyone, um, for the Super Chats and all the messages. Really appreciate y'all. Really, um, I love y'all. Thank you so much for um, for everything and for being here. And let's see, I'm just gonna I'm gonna get much handier with the uh, with the super chats. So forgive me if I slowed down a little bit doing that. I I gotta get a handle on how to do it. Um, so again, thank you to everybody out there, DJ uh, Dwayne Allman. Tim, Talita, DJ, Jack, Jeff, um, Kristen, Talita, Penny, our homegirl Penny, Maddie, Jason. Thank you to everybody out there. Shouts out one more time to our homeboy, um, to our homeboy Cotizi, Cotel, Church of the Eternal Logos. Uh, thank you so much for that last stream we did. Hope we can uh, get together soon. Uh, shouts out to uh, all of our homies out there, of course. Uh, Tristan Haggard, Primal Edge help, uh, Health, um, JD over at Jay's Analysis. Uh, hopefully we can talk to him soon, you guys. I'd love to have him on the channel. Love to have uh, the original Bayes Analyzer, our favorite um, JD from Jay's Analysis over here uh, discussing any topic. And uh, shouts out to all our homeboys out there and our homegirls. And thank you so much, you guys. I love y'all. Hope y'all have a good night. And um, I'll see you soon for the Hocus Pocus 2 JD and Jamie analysis. And again, go back to Cotizi and watch that analysis we did at Church of the Eternal Logos. And uh, please make sure you come back. Leave a comment after the, after the stream's over. Um, share it. Thank you for subbing. And uh, thank you for all your support. I love y'all. That's all I got.